Oh yeah, yeah. And, like and a cool. lot of Dark Souls' DNA comes from Demon Souls, but at the same time, it's refined to a point that most people would say like it's not fair to say that there's no, like it, it. Dark Souls is the one that truly did popularize the whole thing. It's probably why everything's named after it. Yeah. Even though Souls technically, you know, Dark Souls is still the one that everyone's like. There you go. Most people say to start with Dark Souls, and it's like why not start with Demon Souls? And a lot of people would argue. Demon Souls is a bit too. Is the word esoteric? Where it's um, like. Um. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's esoteric is a word that's kind of useful for yeah, this, it's but it's a uh, like niche. Kind of. The only thing is, it got remastered, and so that one I'm pretty sure is much easier to consume than the original. But I remember like. There's a vibe, right? When a friend recommends a video game, and then they say, like, well, wait, don't play it without... Wait, when you're going to play it, let me know, and I'll get you all the right mods, and I'll let you know the, the few things you need to know before going in. Just be like, oh. That's a little bit off-putting, right? Yeah, I try to avoid that sort of thing, unless it's, like, really important. If there is actually, like, there is one or two really big things you need to know before you go in. Um, but usually that isn't like an issue um mm -hmm. normally when people go into a game i just let them go in let it wash all over them let them get the experience but you know sometimes there's that like one or two things that just for their sake you want to be like yeah just just do one or two things real quick you know change this setting to that or or bind that one key and then you know go in you like trust me uh, yeah. but you don't want to like spoil the experience well like uh You're saying when you reach the skeleton guy with the spear make sure that you do the this <laughs> put this not... ring on otherwise you fuck put up that a whole ring game on, but only on your left hand it's important and well yeah and if there's only one of those it's fine but yeah if there's like loads like a laundry list you're kind of like i don't know man at that point maybe just i'll play someone else because uh fallout new vegas i think if ever anyone goes to play that right isn't there like a very big list of uh, recommended mods um there probably is um that's a game that i would just say people can go into as it is though um but yeah I, i'm i'm certain there's tons of good you know mods for it i know there is i mean it's a bethesda game there's gonna be great mods for it um, yeah uh, as far as i'm aware it still it still works without mods right the game it's uh yeah if so if someone was to say Rags, you sure are playing a lot of RimWorld. Boy, that sure looks like fun. I'm going to play RimWorld. I'll say, you bet. I'm glad you're playing RimWorld. Great game. Here's like three mods I think you should start out with, though. You know, you, you should get P Music, RimWorld, you know, whatever. And just, just go download those mods. They're just little quality of life, little things. And then go for it. And then just tailor your experience to whatever you want after that. Hmm. The world of video games, am I right? Boy, I sure do love video games. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um. <clears throat> but also, welcome to EFAB episode two hundred and fifty-four. Wow! Every frame of pause. We're, we're pausing. We're going to be pausing. It's going to be crazy. So far. Our guest for this wonderful episode is none other than Solar Sands, a lad who's uh, been a, been around in in the EFAB chat for a while, and uh, became relatively, I guess, relevant to the episode two weeks or three weeks ago, um, when we were talking about some art things. One of his videos were actually covered by a person who was being covered by another person that we were covering. Mm. It's a bit of a confusing tale, but um, I, I said at the time, we'll try and get you on, have, you, have your own episode so we can chat with you about maybe art, maybe your experiences on the old YouTubes, and maybe we could check out the video, the very video, that Charlie was watching to better understand why uh, Kincaid might very well be the most hated artist that we probably recognize, as the title goes. Welcome, welcome, sir. How you doing? Hello. Yes, hi. hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. I've been watching for about four years or so, and uh, wow. kind of crazy that I'm on because of this whole thing. Uh, I run an art channel, basically. Uh, I make little art documentaries. Some people might call them video essays. Uh, My God, I don't know about. <laughs> I, I I just consider them videos of things I like to talk about. But some people call them that, so I guess I call them that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been doing it for about seven years now. I like to think I'm. Me too. I, I, I know about. <laughs> yeah, I like to think I know a lot about art. Um, 
for art history. And mm. yeah. So I, I guess I want to go a little bit into the pre uh, a little preamble on Do the it. video you guys reacted to and the video I made. So basically, um Thomas Kincaid is an interesting character to me. He's a uh, he's outside of the art world, but he's also well, he was outside of the art world. Um was extremely financially successful, but he was also this kind of controversial figure. I mean, that, that, the video we're going to watch goes into that. Uh, the guy who, who, mentioned, who talked about the video, um, the one who was responding to Charlie... Uh, Ethan <laughs> kinda, is online? Yeah, Ethan is online. He, uh, he kind of <sighs> missed the point of the video, which was fascinating to me since he seems to have watched it. Um, well, he's, so, he's the photons got to his eyes. I don't know what happened after that. Complicated. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but he, he he tried to defend modern art essentially, or, or I mean, so the there's was there's, made. Yeah, there's this period called modern art, which is like from the '60s to the '70s, but we're past that now. So so people call it contemporary art. I think would be like the more "Quote unquote accurate term, but everybody says modern art anyway. So, and everybody knows what you mean. So, <laughs> so that's that. Um, but he did not really do. There's ways to defend you know, modern art, and he didn't really do any of that. He didn't uh, make the arguments I would have made, or that I think anyone is being better faith would have made. <laughs> Well, that's why um, so... we brought up a few things here and there that were like, you know, pieces of what would be considered modern art that uh, we think is actually like pretty valuable and took a lot of introspection to create compared to like, you know, a white canvas. Because there has to be yeah. categories or limits or borders in some ways, otherwise nothing is going to have any way of distinguishing between yeah. each other. And, you know, we tried to go through each of the categories, like you can have great works of art that have very to little... Uh, meaning maybe injected by the artist, like they're just uh, ex expressing maybe this skill. But then you could have the vice versa of someone who's like, I just have an apple, but man, I got a big story to tell you about why I'm holding this apple. And you're just like, okay. And I guess changing those levels, how does that work and what does it mean? And, you know, admitting there's a complexity to it, but at the same time, uh, the video we watched felt like a bitter response the idea that like a skilled painting it's like that's not really even art but this the the fan that's truly art because it's encased in plastic and it has this huge amount of law and it's like okay it came okay. across as this very reactionary anti-traditional anti-classical attitude towards what we consider to be generally like the works of antiquity or any sort of uh, laudation of skill or talent um, or technique. Yeah, exactly. It's a very, it's very, I think I would say like kind of a false binary to me. Um, but like, yeah, essentially the, yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. There's like plenty of like this works of modern, <laughs> there's plenty of modern works, modern art, um, examples that i could point to that i think are, are just better in terms of like more accessible other stuff um the history of art from like the 50s till today it's a lot of artists you know doing things to, s to see what sticks um i can put it like that for example there's like, like basically everything that you could think of has been done you know like uh, a, s a slash canvas has been in a museum, um, you know, the, the famous Duchamp's uh, urinal. Of course, there's, there's even been a art gallery of invisible sculptures. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> Do they, Did they get their so, money yeah. back? Do they have, like, labels? At least? I don't, uh, I don't remember if they have labels, but it was just a lot of empty rooms. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that, that's happened. Um, so there is a lot them. of, there is a, <laughs> there is a lot of, uh, just art, bam, I guess, you know, like putting things together, being, okay, has this been done? Well, 
let's do that. You know, there's kind of that stuff, but there's also a lot of good stuff. Um, and I, uh, Mahler, you made a comment that was kind of funny. You said Jackson Pollock's brother. You know, like, oh, what if he he made some sort of a analogy? Uh, Jackson Pollock actually did have a brother. His name okay. was Charles Pollock. And he was a color field painter. He's uh, not as well known. <laughs> so I mm -hmm. thought that was funny. Um, oh, okay. And he doesn't make drip paintings. He makes, like, uh, paintings that are big blogs. Uh, bleh, blogs. Big blocks of color. Just, um canvas so it falls kind of under the abstract expressionist uh so yeah that's about it for my preamble um if you guys have any specific questions well probably um, what you guys want. the video will be good for a vehicle for that right so to sort of yeah, yeah. Uh, jump in here and there for different things out of uh sure. curiosity because you you said as you said you had seen the show for some time um how did you find efap every frame of pause and uh <laughs> out, of, oh, uh, what, uh, out of curiosity, what about the show do you find uh, interesting? Do you want me to, re to retell the story? Sort well, of? yeah, I mean, uh, we, we got to speak to you for about, I don't know, 10 minutes before we started up, and uh, yeah. I figured when we were, I was listening to you, I was like, oh shit, we've probably done this live a little bit, because <laughs> like, people are going to want to okay. hear what you, because uh, it's funny yeah, to sure. see how people meet up, you know? Yeah, I can I can say. Um, so basically, I heard first heard about Mahler's channel, um, probably a Twitter thread or something like that, and it said, "Don't watch these videos. There, there's movie analysis from an alt right perspective." So for that reason, I kind of avoided your channel initially for, uh, I don't know, like a month or so. But eventually, um, I think this was a bit after the Last Jedi came out. One of your videos got recommended to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the Force Awakens. And I was like, man, this is a really long video. I'm very curious how someone can make an alt-right perspective video this long and this detailed. Um, and then I watched it. It, it. it grabbed my attention. I watched it for a few hours, and I was like, oh, this is just a, a normal analysis it's video. It's yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the idea, anyway. <laughs> it's just going into, into extreme detail on this franchise i like i don't know what they were talking about well, it was weird like then, uh, trying to approach storytelling uh without having a bias in real life so to speak to draw from to instead try to just simply talk about how it connects within and of itself in terms of established stuff i remember at one point i can't remember which uh, youtuber it was but one of them said like that's a very right wing point of view and i was like why would you see <laughs> looking at whether or not things make sense to the right wing that's a weird like... that's a weird uh I think i'm sure they appreciate that <laughs> I guess. Like, all right fine we'll take it it's like oh yeah exactly so the movie reviewers i tended to watch before you well this was like a decent amount of time before like a few years i watched like like in middle school, I watched the Nostalgia Critic. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> a classic. <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, anybody who was watching film reviews back when YouTube was started up, a lot of them would have been watching Nostalgia Critic because he was—he's known as being he's one of the older ones. Yeah, he's one of the kind of pioneers in a sense. Well, it's something that I think is unfair. A lot of people say when you bring up AVGN that you have to respect the guy because he essentially started up like an industry on YouTube, and it's like, okay, but can we say the same for Nostalgia Critic then, please? Give him the respect. He came in early. He did his stuff. Look at him go, <laughs> making skits, inspired everyone. Uh, he practically determined the format for another like billion different content creators. So <laughs> undeniable. Basically. Yeah, I I un unironically love him a little bit. I I think he's a goober. I don't know how well. <laughs> did you did you know. um did you see the we we checked out his I think it was oh, on the anniversary uh, his uh his me. video on the section of a video on uh, the Lion King 2019 where he said like we've got to appreciate that we need these movies in order oh, to have yeah. good content or whatever. It was like what no, the hell? I don't think he I don't think More he's very good at having consistent takes or even no. like being good at analysis but i love this he's so unique <laughs> yes. i love when what he plays makes fun of him he, he makes me laugh some he, he's gotten me to laugh a few times i watched one of his videos just to see what they're like and i was like okay there's there's a funny joke the first minute of this i'm not gonna watch anymore but this is a 
he got me to laugh once and this and <laughs> so as someone yeah, in, but uh, I, I love the, in chat yeah. just said i was so hyped for to boldly flee and i have no shame for that nor should you that was a cinematic event and the many gathered around for that i think we're going to try and watch those at some point that's going to be wild what are you talking about the the channel awesome movies there's like four of them or something Oh, I, I had no idea. And to boldly flee has got like famous production issues of people like suffering to create it and like it broke apart channel laws. <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? It's like a bunch of nerds get together to just film some skits and it has this like controversial shit behind it. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so not nostalgic critic. And eventually I started watching um, Your Movie Sucks, mm -hmm. which I think is closer to your content, definitely. Yeah. Um, and eventually the Plinkett reviews and Red Letter Media. And then I watched yours. And your channel was different because it was a less, it was less like, um, okay, here's some, here's these general guidelines that may or may not work. They're like ocean based. And yours was more like, this contradicts this, this contradicts that, this blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, that's. I like this style of analysis more because we can say definitively when something is isn't working or is working, like mechanically. And I, I like to think I have more, you know, a, a, a mind that likes measurement and is precise myself. <laughs> But I, I do like that kind of standard that you set up, and that's yeah, why yeah, it's not I, just I floaty. This I feel this. I feel that. Well, da, 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 da. there's something that's grounded to it. Yeah, something that you could actually explain to people other than this is how I felt when I watched this thing. You can actually point to its attributes. You can describe them to people. You can sort of share information in a way. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's supposed yeah. to be verifiable beyond your point of view, right? Like definitively exactly that's over there and it doesn't make sense with that thing right you, you don't go like oh i think it makes sense that's how i feel it's like wait what even though that does happen to be fair um and to be fair you and could so, have been wrong about it not making sense because you lack information but that's the that's the process i suppose well and, and if you are wrong with something then you have more to work with than oh i feel you're wrong yeah yeah, I, I, I watch a lot of, I've watched a, a, a decent chunk of video essays now on movies and stuff, and I, I do think there's certainly this tendency for a video essay to have this, you know, grand, weighty, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. insightful message. What did we it. learn, and sort I, of thing. Yeah, and I think they get weighed down a lot by that, because it just becomes... Uh, it's this oversaturated emotional i think it becomes oh, self-parody at one point right because uh the formula gets set there's a lot of channels on youtube that understand perfectly you need it to be about 20 to 30 minutes first half like explaining you know how this all happened where it all came from and then just some kind of emotional core that you have to figure out i remember i can't remember who it was but there was a youtuber who said, like, they, they, it's, it's ruined it at this point because, like, weekly they just watch a new movie, and the one goal they have when watching it is you've got to figure out um, uh, maybe not even a theme, but just something from the film. Like, if you watch Iron Man and you're just like, what's what, what, what do we take from uh, Always stand up for yourself. I don't know. Uh, always be strong. Um, always change your mind when you need to or something. That, that'll work. And then they end up, like, pumping videos out so often that is supposed to have like a profound message, it'll start to become parody. And they're oftentimes quite funny. That's what ends up happening when we cover them. We're just like, Iron Man is about understanding that there's so much more to the world than just money. And you're like, wait, wait what? <laughs> like, is that even what Iron Man's about? I don't even like what... Uh... And then it's the dramatic pauses, the text on screen, the almost like they're going to break Empathy. down into tears. Yeah, and they'll have, like, a invented story about how their grandpa used to tell them that money's the only thing that matters, but then yeah, the grandma said... Yeah, they'll just lie. Said, yes, <laughs> they'll, they'll just tell lies about their life. Or after the, uh, the Red Shadow Legends ad. Yeah. <laughs> that's... More on, speaking of, more on speaking that. Speaking of uh, a life that's beyond money, 
Let me introduce you to our sponsor, Raid Shadow. Yeah, you know, Raid Shadow Legends is one of the most ambitious RPGs. <laughs> And there's a like ukulele or whistling sound, yeah. just like oh. yeah. But it's the it's the it's the what's it the kazoo, the yeah the probably playing the Shadow Legends theme. And it's yeah, it's like how the hell did we get here? And it's like well, because once upon a time there were people who influenced these people who were doing it legitimately, genuinely, and had something to say about a thing. But it's like like everything else, the iterations become so like weird eventually. Because like even people like High Top are aware of their own styles, and they're just like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm just doing it anyway. And like, I sound like um, on the verge of tears each video. And you're just like, Are you okay? But it, yeah, it's just when that happens every time. Yeah, it becomes <laughs> uh, too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this can like relate to art history a lot because people have this uh, idea that. You know, art history is, okay, tell us what the painting made you feel. Do do this interpretation and stuff. But in actual, like, academic art history and art analysis, you don't do a lot of that. You actually have to basically, they actually discourage you from, oh, how'd this make you feel? It, they tell you what, okay, analyze what's actually there, make conclusions based on what is in the painting, what is what is here, do your research on, like, what the historical context of this is, at your sources, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes, you know, that's like a, little, a much stronger way to analyze something other than, you know, this is, this is what this reminds me. I do some of the, this is what this reminds me of, oh, this is what I feel about it on yeah. the channel because it's a lot more of a free YouTube thing. But well, and, I, and it reminds I'm, everybody I'm, you're human, which is a good you know, bonus. Yeah, exactly. And that's what YouTube is for much, but I think people are taking it way too far. Like. I'm I'm really trying to make an effort these days to um, make a, a very comprehensive list of all the references and sources I have mm -hmm. in a in a text document because uh, it, it's a lot more organized and you can link back to what you have. And e even this video I, I made here is like very little of my like strictly my interpretation or opinion. It's it's more of a accounting what happened uh, with this this man's life and his paintings well yeah and i mean that's that's kind of our thing today was going to be to check it out so that we can get a good idea of maybe why everybody hates him slash All there right. are people who hate him because um for anybody who doesn't remember when we were covering the video with uh critical having seen it critical thought it was going to be about uh, other artists that are more known for their blatters or uh, how should I put it? Controversial paintings in the sense of like, what the fuck is this? But the reality is, of course, that Thomas Kincaid is making images that might be associated w with very much high quality to anyone who's not familiar with what he gets up to and why in the industry surrounding it and stuff. And so the video, as I understand it, is to try and provide context for that. Um, yes. Meanwhile, Ethan is online, kind of took it a different direction of like, it's all soulless work that doesn't have any meaning and that art is supposed to be about... Because it's so funny, he lets you know right at the beginning of his video, he's like, I used to think like you, but then I grew up. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. But then I went to the art gallery. I understood. Yeah. And I learned to appreciate the banana taped to the wall. Well, the greatest irony of the whole video, I think we pointed this out a couple times, was that he's like, you need to actually, you know, think deeper, think more, and understand how it makes you feel when he told us again and again that what made him appreciate any piece of artwork is being told by the creator what to think about it. Um, which, by the way, I'm more than happy to include context from the creator when checking out a piece of artwork. I have no problem with that. It's just that it's difficult, I think, to argue from a position of the value of art is coming strictly from reading the flavor text. Uh... It shouldn't be from the thing itself alone or whatever. And it's like, holy shit, there's so many pieces of art in the world that I find like fascinating or mind blowing, and I didn't require an artist to tell me what it's what it means. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, I know this video uh, pretty well uh, since I made it. So yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know if I'm gonna do a lot of pausing. Uh, whatever you guys well, want to say. Something. Presumably, you're familiar with the show, and at that point, we're probably just gonna talk about things that come to mind. And uh, all right. Yeah, this yeah. video. Yeah. Uh, wait, have I got? I've loaded up the right one. I think right. The this most is Big hated Buck a... Bunny. That's the right one. Yeah. Yeah, Big Buck Bunny. I really like Big. It's really good. It's really good. Big Buck Bunny big is Chungus, underrated. But, uh... Yeah. 
What's interesting here oh, is that um, the video is called The Most Hated Artist You Probably Recognize. I put it into Watch Together and the preview description, or is it the description that says To Hate a Thomas Kincaid? Yeah, that's the like subtitle. Right, right. Uh, okay. Funny story. I I may, I was like, this is the tent t title I like. It's not the title get that gets These clicks. So make I changed. Oh shit. So oh, I changed good. it and um, it got like the views exploded when I put it to the most hated artists you probably recognize. That makes sense. Which I like. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a format that the, that works. Right, having a bit of mystery there. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay. Uh, I think I paused it. Yeah, this I mean, is my well, first here we time go. Using this, so apologies if These I. These paintings mess make up my corneas hurt. I'm ashamed that this artist lived in my former hometown. The George W. Bush of art. Worthless. I don't even know they what that means. Me <laughs> they are the George W. Bush words. of they are art. Awful. Simply awful. It belongs in the trash. This it art is invaded stupid Iraq. art for stupid people. The worst Damn. paintings I've ever seen, and they will haunt me for the next half an hour. Yeah, so these quotes were read out, and uh, Charlie assumed this was about, like, uh, uh, Jackson Pollock or... I forget the other one he <laughs> named. Um, which is interesting, yeah, because right. you get to... It, it's almost fun to see people react to this to be like, who are we talking about? If you don't know, you know, go again. Those are all real quotes from comments, reviews, and articles concerning one artist and his work. Gee, these paintings must be pretty bad then, huh? What are they, pictures of babies eating each other alive? The scatological scribbles of a lunatic? No. These are the kinds of paintings those quotes are referring to. Now, if you're like me, you might be a bit confused. It's um, it's fascinating to me because uh, I've seen a decent chunk of this video, and I was thinking to myself because I didn't have the context. I was like, if I were to come up with a reason for why people would hate these, maybe it's in in how they were created. Maybe there's something I don't know, and it's like really factory level or something. Um, um, you know, like yeah. like trying to think of what context could it be because fundamentally it seems inconsistent uh, on its face, right? Because it's just like, why would you hate this? But the thing is, like, so many people don't know more context. But to be fair, once you have all of the context, I don't think everyone's going to hate them anyway. Exactly. I, I don't... Uh, well, I'll, it gets into it, but I, I don't hate these paintings even... Mm -hmm. What's there to hate? The <laughs> these that's are the puzzles the, that your grandparents put together. That was what I was going to exactly. say, though, is, like, the hatred comes from, like, all this additional context. Because seeing this in isolation, it's like, why would you hate this? It's a lovely like, it's... image. So oh, this is, this is something uh, I wish I had brought up in the video, but it, it only came back later. So, you know, Jackson Pollock, you know, the famous, uh, oh, artist shit guy <laughs> that everybody defends for modern art. He, yeah. um, he kind of killed somebody. What? What? Yeah. <laughs> Did they slip well, on one of his paintings? He kind well, of killed I mean, somebody? He, uh, he, uh, he, was, he, he was drunk driving with somebody and he smashed into a tree and they both died. Damn. Oh. So... Yeah, he kind of, that's, that's the end of Jackson Pollock. He kind of killed somebody. Uh, so I just find it ironic that, you know, they, everybody defends Jackson Pollock. He has this moral baggage to him as well. Yeah, I mean, that would that suck. Make me, yeah, that doesn't make me like, oh, these paintings are bad now. Yeah, oh, I see, yeah, I see again. So yeah. Well, something that was mentioned, I think, in a top comment um, that we... I can't remember if we pieced it together or not, but it was fascinating that um, one of the pluses Ethan is online gave to uh, Pollock was the in his work... His work is, like, partially fueled by the experiences he had as a child. He had, like, a lot of trauma that comes through. Meanwhile, Kincaid clearly has trauma, and uh, we, do, we, like, discount it. Like, it couldn't possibly be attached to the work. And if so, if one said like, obviously there's no where's the trauma in this image? It's like no no no. You you you'd you'd argue that maybe it's fuel well, of the, the artist. That was the village where he was brutally raped. <laughs> it's like a wholesome fairy tale village where he was brutally attacked. But, but yeah, I was gonna say like you you could argue the. Did you almost say murdered? Where he was brutally. I was gonna murdered. say it wouldn't really make much sense. <laughs> 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 this is where I was murdered. Maybe he drew it in heaven. But, uh, or painted. But I was going to say, it can go the reverse direction. You can, you could go that that he paints these to uh, express the reverse of what the trauma, you know, would like. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many ways it can come out. It's it's awkward to, um, 
describe any piece of artwork as soulless, you, but like it's not something that I've not done. It's it's a, like a, you know, like a soaker felt fucking soulless to me. But at the same time, <laughs> you uh, you hope you have a, a decent amount of context supporting it, and I think it's difficult to describe paintings like this that way. Um, but we'll see. Maybe by the end of the episode, we'll feel that way. Who knows? Why, oh why, are these seemingly unremarkable paintings of cottages, one would usually see on the covers of jigsaw puzzles, so viciously hated by some people? In fact, not just hated, but accused of being dishonest, damaging hmm. to art and culture itself. These are works by the late artist Thomas Kincaid. You could make What's a very good for? case that Thomas Kincaid was the most successful artist in the 21st century so far. His works can be seen on mugs, t-shirts, calendars, and probably somewhere in your grandmother's living room. Thomas Kincaid's own company claims his work can be seen in one out of every 20 American homes. And at the height of his career, his company generated $130 million in sales in one year. A lot of money. Doing pretty well, huh? Or I guess he's not, yeah, he not doing well right now uh, oh. himself, but you know, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Now, I can totally see how someone could dislike his work. Perhaps they find it too excessive in its sentimentality, or is garish, or perhaps they find it simply generic. But to capital H, hate it. I admit, I was initially a bit confused by that. In fact, people hate the art and the man so much that in articles about the man's death, you can find such comments as these. I hate Thomas Kincaid with every fiber <laughs> of my being. I do like the the format because you want you look at all these uh, picturesque <laughs> images like capturing Christmas or a cozy village that is like fucking I want to kill this guy <laughs> like like oh shit okay why but oh yeah nothing. so much context to come our long national nightmare is over there's nothing wrong with liking Kincaid's paintings but in but. my opinion. There is something wrong with people that like his paintings. Yeah, that's basically the same thing. The thing is that the people that buy this crap are ignorant morons from the southeast and midwest of the US. You know, the people responsible for electing George Bush. Their opinions on- That's what they meant by the George Bush of art, I yeah. guess. It's fascinating, <laughs> like, the, like, this point in history. Um, it's like, a lot of these things are, are, are fairly old, even- when I made the video, like these comments and stuff, mm -hmm. it's like, man, people, uh, people have always been kind of tribalistic, haven't they? The more <laughs> things change, the more things stay the same. Yep. Except like no goes. one talks about George Bush that much anymore. Now it's all. He's not cool to talk no. about anymore. This new guy. The other guy. The, yeah. Uh, I think his, his name, like, Trump? Crew or Rump or something? Cramp. Not sure. Norman Rockwell, what? Norman, yeah, yeah. Norman Rockwell, President yeah. Norman. On art are about as valid as a Gibbons opinion on quantum physics. Well, Sir, hey, look, madam, right, I... yeah, I was gonna say, I don't know. Have you spoken to all the Gibbons? Do you know, they say they're smart, so yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I know this is the internet, but if you could kindly remove your head from your own rectum, I think you'd be doing yourself a favor. What could have possibly prompted such venom? from a few cottage paintings. And I'm just curious about what snake that was. That was an interesting looking snake. Mm. Uh, Ain't it? I, uh, answer, I hope it was a venomous probably, snake. I, I'm, I'm guessing you probably Google just snake and you know, <laughs> how much it uh, I, Yeah, <laughs> I downloaded it uh, off like Dreams Time or, or something. Yeah, I Googled it. cool snake. Ain't it oh, a neat a cool design one. that the fangs like fold in? And yeah, when the mouth cool. opens I'm glad you appreciate out. the snake because, you know, usually I, I spend decent amount of time making finding the right stock photos yeah uh, so, so yeah well, like there you go. it captured yeah, cool the essence fight. very well what you'll find yeah. is that the reason for this hatred may have less to do with the art itself and more to do with matters of taste the art world and even as you saw in the last comment politics today Yay. we'll learn about the many reasons to hate a thomas kincaid Maybe we'll hate him by the end. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Thomas Kincaid was born into relative poverty in 1985 in California. He had poor this relatives. I, I just want to make it known. This is wrong. It's 1958. Uh, uh -huh. this was... It sounded like, because uh, why? Well, he, yeah. he, he died. It's, he's, he died, right? At some point? 
Yeah. Yes, he died uh, 2011, 2010. Uh, I mentioned. Yeah, because it. It, it, it seemed like that, and it's like he doesn't look like he's 30 in those uh, in those interviews. Yeah, people. So I've, he doesn't I've, look like 30 in this <laughs> image. Like, yeah. yeah, it's true. He doesn't. That that is true. You got some of those old looking children, also, but yeah. Was there just a lot of people taking photos in black and white in like 1985? You oh, know, yeah. for like artists. Maybe there were. People, yeah. Yes. Yeah, definitely artists who no. are like, I hate this color shit, it's ruining everything. Uh, I pinned a comment to make sure no one gets confused. What happened is I just recorded the line. I probably wrote it down in the script wrong, recorded it, edited it, and it just completely passed by. I just did not catch it. <laughs> oh, it happens. Well, it was the uploaded. worst is when you have all your friends proof it and none of them catch it, and then you're just like, wow, how can I rely oh, on yeah. any of you ever again? This is you guys' fault, not mine. Yeah. He right. attended the University of California, Berkeley, and Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Before college, he was known for having a natural talent for drawing, mm. and was mentored by Glenn Wessels, a former college professor of art who lived <laughs> just a few up. hundred... He's just old, rags that's what old people look like. Yeah, he's old. <laughs> feet looks like his eyes home. are on different, like, lines of latitude. <laughs> he's old. He's just tilted the head, rags, okay? Old and tilt. Uh -oh. Okay. Wessels would eventually encourage him to transfer to the College of Design in Pasadena. Also, J Max said, I think it was a bush viper, Fringy. Just uh, <gasps> a bush viper? Yeah, they come out of the bushes. Oh, man. Me. Right. Or well, alternatively, it doesn't. That doesn't look like an Australian one. I'm guessing it's from elsewhere. Who but knows? Again, I'm not sure what an Australian one is supposed to look like. We do have green snakes here. It's just that they're in rainforests typically. Well, they'll have the accent, right? That's how you tell. Well, when they jump out of the bushes, g'day, I'm gonna bite ya. <laughs> nom nom nom. That's yeah, it, yeah, that's venom. Before his business adventures, Kincaid worked in background painting for an animated film. As far as the actual technique goes, uh, for the most part, we... I just want to say, uh, the, the man on the uh, left, James Gurney, uh, this is fascinating, because he's a, a very talented oil painter. Mm -hmm. He has a YouTube channel, and he made a, a lot of kids' books for, uh, it's called Dinotopia. They're very, very high-quality oil paintings, um, illustrations. They're very neat. They're like steampunk, dinosaur, uh, fantasy children's uh, stories. They're very skilled. I just thought that was connection was interesting, because <laughs> here he is with Thomas Kincaid. The art world, filled with connections, I imagine. We used a simple technical procedure. We'd just start out with a big, wide brush and lay the thing in. Uh, very scrubby at first, and then as we went, we'd uh, gradually uh, tighten the strokes down. We had to try to keep the time on each painting very limited because there was a number of paintings to be done, over a thousand for the film. And traveled by... You all love processes like that, where it starts out as goop, and then it eventually becomes like, you're like, oh shit, that's like a whole... Wow, okay, nice, good job. And then the... The artist is like, yeah, ugh, it wasn't even that hard. It like, took five minutes. And he's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's once you know what you're doing, it's pretty easy, actually. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, just stretching. I freight train across the country, sketching with James Gurney. When Kincaid was 20, he reportedly experienced a Christian oh, yeah. reawakening. These newfound values seeped their way into his art, which now focused on yep. optimism, natural beauty, and inspirational settings. Kincaid was able to amass such profits from building up hundreds of Thomas Kincaid's signature galleries, which sprung up all over the country at their height and eventually spread internationally. These signature galleries sold high-quality digital reproductions, where one could have the option of having a specially trained assistant highlight the canvas-textured reproduction one was about to purchase. This highlighting consisted of the assistant adding small dots of color to give it detail and texture that was unique to that painting. The stores themselves Lovely. were also illuminated yeah. and decorated in a way totally opposite to the sterile white environments usually Boo, seen in Boo, sterile white environments. Boo. Well... I mean, you know, we know why they do that, right? It's to isolate the art away from any other influences to give you its its influence on you alone, right? Rather than the walls or the nature of the place having its effects. I'm guessing that's part of the goal anyway. I guess it would be different for every gallery, right? Depending on what the people want. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is like, this is a kind of a brilliant, I don't know if he invented this kind of thing, but it, it's kind of a brilliant uh, business move to... Distance yourself from this kind of setting and make your paintings 
uh, that stores themselves like the paintings. Pretty yeah. Fascinating. It's, um, well, that's the thing, right? Because a lot of people would set up galleries this way because people set up galleries this way instead of thinking about it, yes. maybe. Um, but yeah. Galleries. Creating a cozy and homely atmosphere. Kincaid excelled at building his brand throughout every aspect of the purchase. Thomas Kincaid was in the money-making business. All his art appealed to the masses and strayed away from any negative or even ambiguous themes. He had successfully commercialized his art to an extreme extent, and it worked. There are people who were and are passionate about these paintings. Clearly, many are willing to pay for reproductions, and many collect them religiously. The people who buy them are glad to have them. They find comfort in them. Since 1994, Thomas Kincaid's company, Media Arts Group, has traded on the NASDAQ and then on the New York Stock Exchange, making Kincaid the only artist to be a small cap equity issue. It is estimated his business brought in $100 million in revenue annually. Thomas Kincaid was wildly successful. And that's where the story ended. What a legend. Wow, yeah. that's incredible. I'm Such so great glad successes, this had a happy ending. This huge amount of Good artwork. Job. All industry, many satisfied customers, and yet there were some meanies that were like, hey, I don't like your work. That's pretty much it. Good stuff. All right. Unless there's another chapter. As easy as it would be to dismiss all this hatred as- You're an awful son of a bitch. Our long national nightmare is over. I'm not Jeez. proud to admit my first thought was yes. This is, this is comments in relation to uh, Kincaid dying. Just jealousy of his spectacular success and I'm sure that's a reason for some. For others, it certainly goes deeper than that. When you go searching for what people think of his work, you'll find a lot of negative reviews that use the word kitsch. This word appears everywhere. Kitsch, kitsch, king of kitsch. But what is kitsch? My first vague- My god, that felt like classic video essay stuff right there, where it came <laughs> on the screen, nice. Yeah. <laughs> of the word was something that's popular but also poor quality. The Oxford Art Dictionary attempts to define it as objects or design considered to be in poor taste because of excessive garishness or sentimentality, but that might be too narrow. According to cultural critic and philosopher Walter Benjamin, kitsch is, unlike art, a utilitarian object lacking all critical distance between object and observer. It offers instantaneous emotional gratification without intellectual effort. According to Sir Roger Scruton, kitsch is fake art, expressing fake emotions, whose purpose is to deceive the consumer into thinking he feels something deep and serious. Good fucking god, I was like, wow, I wonder if job. this applies to... <laughs> I feel like it's a punching bag right now, but I'm sorry, it's one of the newest ones. I'll switch to Loki, I'm sure, in a couple of weeks. But Ahsoka just being like, is fake art expressing fake emotions whose purpose is to deceive <laughs> the consumer into thinking he feels something deep and serious? It's like, oh my god. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. These, yeah, these quotes are very fascinating to me, especially because uh, these two people are, are kind of on the opposite sides of the political and philosophical spectrum. <laughs> mm. <laughs> they seem to like kind of overlap with this, with this definition, which is... Uh, it's, um, it's probably not going to enter into my vocabulary, even though it's kind of useful. I just feel like when I s saying kitsch um, re requires immediately after to explain what you mean. That seems yeah. to be like a, which is a useless word almost at that point. Uh, yeah, I, I, my problem with it was it was too exactly that, just vague and like, well, what do you mean exactly? It's just, just, just tell me what you think. About and then the you arch. say all of that, and it's like, oh, I got you. Serious. I think it's quite a claim to say something expresses fake emotions, but it might give a better idea of what kitsch is. Even famous, well-established contemporary artists have been accused of using kitsch. My general understanding is art that is not challenging, not complex. Wow, look at this event. Crazy. All these fellas hanging out look all at, at once. Historic, look I would say. Him. Yeah, I mean, they, they really had to... Schedule everybody to get everybody in the set. Yeah, well, this was all candid. They didn't even know they were being drawn. They were just hanging out. You yeah. Know? But ultimately, the word is hard to... Oh my god, what is that? <laughs> hey, it, if it gives you feelings, if it makes you feel things, you know, that's art, it's art. It's just 
It's just a bit, you know, yeah, that makes sense. Fine. Its vagueness allows it to be applied to a wide range of stuff, and for that reason I find it inadequate to fully describe why people and art critics would hate this kind of work. Articles and reviews will also frequently use terms like garish, overly sentimental, and nauseatingly cheerful. All understandable reasons for disliking something, but even so, how does that translate from just mediocre art to art being a national nightmare? Thomas Kincaid has been frequently compared to Norman Rockwell, mainly because of his appeal to American values and <sighs> usually cheerful scenes. Some have even put both their work into the same dreaded category of kitsch, but I think a more fitting comparison is Bob Ross. Both mm. made serene art that appealed to large mainstream audiences. Both mostly consisted of landscapes without people, and both lives were even cut short at around the same age. Now, I love Bob Ross. I mean, who doesn't? Squirrel. But I wouldn't really call his work challenging. In fact, one can make the case that it is kitsch. No, the significance of Bob Ross is not really his art, but the hundreds of PBS videos he made painting that art. Bob Ross was able to reach millions of people and inspire them to pursue oil painting through easy to follow a la prima techniques and the soothing earnest commentary that works both as a tutorial and as relaxing meditation. As therapy for a lot of therapy. people. Yeah, and that I find off. extremely. I, th I think there was an awareness of that that like you're here to be comfy and chill and yeah. just think and then, about stuff. When he's when he in there, stories, he's got squirrels when he, and yeah, birds. Yeah, he tells the stories about the animals that reside in his you know pocket. It's like, yeah. oh man, how quite. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. I mean, he just pull out this squirrel. He... But I guess I guess this is interesting to think about because it's like it's you know it's what are what did people get from bob ross and it's like yeah there were the paintings and the paintings look nice but it but the the videos and and talking through the process and inspiring people to do art was uh arguably the big thing that he did more so yeah. than than the, the paintings themselves oh yeah precisely i mean he, he he's probably gonna go down as one of uh one of the great artists of the 20th uh, 21st 20th uh, century because it's just it's beyond his paintings his influence yeah i mean that's it, it makes a lot of sense that uh that's kind of how it goes the artist and the art both have this like running reputation and they can be in tandem or support each other or bring each other down or one could be great and the other but not so much so, like we have to talk a lot about the nature of uh, appreciating art in spite of the artist or appreciating the artist mm -hmm. in spite of the art, uh, that does come up as well. There's a lot of really nice and awesome people who make shit, <laughs> which is, you know, yeah. it, just, it happens. I mean, I, I imagine there's going to be a point, um, maybe a few, a uh, few decades or so, where there's going to be YouTubers who are singled out in, in history as, you know, these are the guys who really push stuff. Um, th this is like the people who changed the game. I don't know. I have no clue who those people are going to be because, you know, sometimes a lot of people uh, who were popular in history during that time actually become obscure later on because their influence just isn't as big. So yeah, well, yeah. there would have been a well, time. It's hard to say. There would have been a time where Boogie would have been considered one of the most positive, influential, <laughs> and blah 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 YouTubers. <laughs> but obviously, if his reputation would be summarized today. There are still yeah. documentaries coming out about how horrible he is. It's just like, good God. Exactly. Like, like Mr. Beast, you know, he's like super yeah. popular right now, but it might be one more like, I, I don't know. Um, like, uh, oh, who's, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's the, that's the thing, you know? Well, yeah, um, this applies to artists say. in other industries as well. It's also when chat mentioned Kevin Smith. Like, if you take him from a particular decade, they're complete opposites. Um, the reputation different, like writers, directors, well, just artists in general. So sometimes this, uh, you want to be bronzified. Movie, Bob. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think of a time <laughs> where his reputation was positive. I don't know. Like, well, was... I, he... Is a uh, his uh, fast food tweet is going down in history for sure. I, I, it's well, I that's a, that should be at a gallery. That tweet. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. I wonder if that's a thing anywhere in the world. It probably is a gallery that is exclusively tweets. Uh well, give it time. You know. Yeah, I yeah, feel like that's gonna happen time. if it hasn't happened already. Probably NFT tweets or something stupid like that. So, 
I presume so. The, I don't know anything about this. Uh, this artist, the the guy, the the central point of the video. Um, oh, my Ta Ta presumption. Ta Ta no, 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 no. I know about uh, the the other guy. Okay. Yeah. All so right. like, I don't really know. I, so my first thought when it was like people hate him, it's like, oh, is there something about the process that he uses to make the art that is like something that people don't like? Um, yeah. Obviously, we're only halfway, so there's probably more to the story. We got reveals to come. Yes. Process, yeah, I had a feeling when they the... when they showed all the images, I'm like, we've we got to be going like meta or something. Um, well, yeah, a little so, bit. So uh... I'm kind of interested because that term "kitsch," it's like, yeah, it's kind of a funny meme to say that Ahsoka is that, but it's not a term that I think I'm ever going to use. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. I there's a, I I don't know, I find it a little bit uh pretentious. Just say it. Yeah. Um, it's it's just uh, because something that I find interesting is it because it was something that was baked into those definitions, right? It's like it's art that isn't challenging. Um, which I find I find a little bit strange as a thing to get like incredibly angry about because yeah. sometimes you just want to paint a beautiful landscape and the idea that there's something like less valuable about that because it's not challenging because it's you know nice happy trees and a and happy clouds in the sky you know what I mean it's like all right calm down well I, I, I yeah, assume... not everything has to be some emotional struggle or something. I assume that's why you... you just enjoy a village with uh... flowers. Bob Ross has been brought up because he's not known for making challenging art that made everyone no, ponder he, their he existence, might... and yet he's not hated. So it's like, so what is the key? That's that's um, kind of my thinking. Is like I'm guessing that there's more to the story. Yeah. What that that the other guy didn't have squirrels in his videos. So yeah, if he had squirrels <laughs> and birds, he just pulled them it's out of his that... pocket there in a show. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, most, you know, most of these like Jackson Pollock people. Uh, these modern artists, contemporary artists, they usually start out with classical training, or at, at least uh, for sure the ones in the 50s did. They, they would just paint raw, regular subjects, like a landscape or a group of figures or around, uh, around a cart or something like that, and, and, and have it be realistic and stuff. So it, when people say that, oh, Jackson Pollock couldn't draw, I mean, he could. He could draw, definitely. He had classical training. He just chose not he, to. Yeah, he j he just chose not to. This was the thing he wanted to pursue. So yeah. No, uh, you guys just say a little, just a little and... misconception people have, but it's you guys it's, say it's relevant. But... Fleems and tisms without restraint. Yet kitsch is the cutoff point. Yes, Fleems yes. and tisms makes way yeah. more sense. Fleems yeah, and tisms is, is we love fun. our floop words. They, yeah, uh, floop words are fun. They're just so much, you know, more clean. Everyone knows what you mean when you say fleem. Obviously, exactly. no one's confused. Of course, again, the big, the big thing is when I say "fleem," it's it's almost like the opposite of pretentious. It's kind of clownish. <laughs> so that's why. That's yeah, why kinda. I, like I guess. Words. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it's the word of the people. The people just reminded me, like, I love it. Whatever Bob Ross is like, uh, put his paintbrush in the water. He's like, beat the devil out of it, right? That's what he says. Mm. <laughs> yes. Great little phrases. Because uh, it's just he's he's got a fascinating like life story. Wasn't the thing that he he like basically taught himself to paint when he was uh on a military base up in Alaska, and so that's kind of where a lot of the inspiration stems from for uh, the kinds of landscapes he typically painted. I don't know a lot about his backstory. Uh, I think he he was taught. He had a teacher at some point who taught him specifically the alla prima technique, which is he's using as the wet on wet where you basically paint really fast without letting anything dry. Um, but yeah, there. I think, I, I don't know, I can't like contradict what you said. Well, I mean, a lot of people in chat are saying that yes, the, it, it was while well, he was on a mil uh, like an Air Force base. Um, Used painting yeah, maybe, to I don't stay know the, the exact backstory. Both Thomas Kincaid and Bob Ross sought to comfort their audiences through painting. However, when it came to them as people, Thomas Kincaid was no Bob Ross. <gasps> Thomas Kincaid was, he was a very serial murderer. Vain. He branded. Well, so the thing is, I think if you're watching this video, you might expect it could go that way. <laughs> you'd be like, is, yeah. there, is he? A, is, did he paint with like the the tears of children? Is that what's happening? Himself as Thomas Kincaid, the painter of light, trademarked. Look, even if you like his work, <laughs> making everything <laughs> glow is not funny. something I would consider a remarkable use of light. These guys are painters of light, not Thomas Kincaid. He's also said things like, God is my art agent, and 
We have a grassroots movement emerging in my art and in the country, and there's 10 million people out there that if I give the word, will go out and pick at any museum I want them to. That's not um, good. That's not like, great. Uh, um, <laughs> he, he, had, he has some quotes. Right. Ugh, that, yeah, that, that just feels like a villain line. Like, <laughs> do they not know how they sound? It's like, no. In one case, he bet journalist Susan Orlean a million dollars that a major museum would hold a Thomas Kincaid retrospective in his lifetime. Thomas Kincaid was also not shy to talk about his Christian beliefs and conservative family values. The prominent light so often seen in his paintings, he said, represented the light of God penetrating the darkness as well as Jesus' light of the world. He quite openly resented the elitist art world, insisting that his work was uplifting and a positive influence on the world, while modern art was nihilistic and ugly. Well, the fact is, like, it would have been high... I could have totally imagined it being super uplifting to many, many people, but the irony, of course, yeah. is that it pissed off a shit ton of people as well. And so it's like, I guess we should acknowledge that. Uh, in the same vein, we should acknowledge this art is... Uh enough to make people be like, what the fuck am I looking at? But it's also enough to make a lot of people go, ooh, interesting, oh, inspiring. Like, there are, you know, you get all kinds of reactions out there. Like, yeah. For everything. What exactly are these ones? Is that Michael Moore, uh, or am I seeing it, things that I don't exist? I was thinking Michael Moore as well. That I lady right there? No, 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 the guy on the left in the hat. I was thinking Michael yeah. Moore as well. Wait, what I did you say, Rex? <laughs> I was, I was, I, I asked that lady. Oh, well, there are breasts, but um, I think, I, like I said, I'm, I wasn't sure breasts. if that was Michael Moore. I'm not sure. It's the yeah, hat. I, That's what made me think Oh, uh, yeah. I wish I had done more research on these images specifically, because I, I, I basically just found, you know, this was a quick visual. I just found, <laughs> okay, here's some painting, or some sculptures. It looks like just paper mache uh, yeah. sculptures. Of they are people. striking, you could say. This, yeah. if, if we walked into the gallery and you asked me for my comment on this, I'd be like, uh, don't know. <laughs> to, yeah, to... I don't really know what I'm meant to make of it, but... Maybe yeah. I need the law. We need to read the law first, and then we can know. Mm. In one interview, he said, The number one quote critics give me is, Tom, your work is irrelevant. Now that's a fascinating, <laughs> fascinating comment. Yes, irrelevant to the little subculture, this microculture of modern art. But here's the point. My art is relevant because it's relevant to 10 million people. That makes me the most. Where's he get this 10 million number from? E e emails. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he gets a lot of emails. Where he figured it out. Are they like I, subscribers I to his actually. work or something that they get? I think it was uh, just a common like statistic he figured out from his business because they estimated like one in 20 American homes. I don't know how true that is, but like I could believe it because sounds good. I went to my grandmother's house and was like. Oh, there's Thomas Kincaid on the calendar. I'm like, okay, well, maybe it yeah, is. Yeah, it'll true. be on the calendar. It'll it'll be a puzzle. Well, because people there, are saying yeah. sales, but like it's a little bit more complicated than just what you've sold. Because obviously, it's he, uh... he could be lying. He could be outright lying. Um, but I mean, it's probably probably more than a million, definitely. Well, yeah, and because uh, I thought maybe he might have set up something like um, he he gives out work every so often to anybody who's uh. Asking, or like, like he had have like. A I was trying to think. It's not quite the same as it would be these days, but you know, like if 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 people were paying for some kind of service, we receive a new Kincaid every month or half year or something. Kincaid, yeah, monthly, yeah, the monthly something Kincaid. like that. Oh, a Kincaid box. Well, because the it's thing a, is, everyone's already a... put it out, but you could totally see his works being got little cards or little postcard sort of things. You'd know, be like, oh, look, that's nice. It comes in a frame if you pay more. Something you can put on the desk and be like, ah. Oh. Love it. Not the least, because I'm relevant to real people. Thomas Kincaid also allegedly frequently engaged in shady business practices. Sexual debauchery. Uh -oh. Such as defrauding authorized Kincaid dealers and exploiting their Christianity to get them into the Kincaid business by dressing it up as a religious opportunity, all the while getting Dang. them to take on unreasonable amounts of Kincaid's work at fixed prices. Many gallery owners claimed Kincaid had ruined them financially in the name of God. Kincaid oh. dismissed these accusations. Well, that makes it okay. Accusations <laughs> while also settling some of them. Kincaid was also an alcoholic, and as his businesses began to decline, he engaged more frequently in drunken episodes where he was prone to cursing, 
heckling performers. One I don't think Bob Ross had drunken episodes. Didn't he? Do we just not know about them? I don't know, actually. Did he? Oh, uh, no. Uh, I, well, to my knowledge, uh, no. <laughs> okay. Thing I mean, I, 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 I would believe it, maybe. 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 Maybe he was that just a chill drunk, drunk, and he would just stop painting again. Yeah, maybe he's like, chill drunk. Yeah, yeah maybe. The Pooh statue while yelling, this one's for you, Walt, which I don't even think that one's bad. Wait, That's what? hilarious. Wait, hang and on. Drunk <laughs> driving. Was he... <laughs> Context missed. Rollback. He stuck up his what? Where he was prone to cursing, heckling performers, one accusation of groping, urinating on a Winnie the Pooh statue oh, while no. yelling, this one's for you, Walt. No, it's Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> oh. not Winnie the Pee. <laughs> <laughs> this one's for you, Walt. What the hell? <laughs> I just want to he know what... Of his, he was ahead of his time. I want to know what Walt would think about that. <laughs> He'd be so confused. Walt's like, but I love Thomas Kincaid. <laughs> which I don't even think that one's bad. That's hilarious. Yeah. And drunk driving, which is less hilarious. That's pretty yeah. funny. And yeah. eventually, on April 6, 2012, he was killed by an accidental overdose of Valium and alcohol. Uh-oh. Don't mix even your Valium and alcohol. Death, no, uh, pills and booze, that's what can get you. A legal battle <laughs> over his... Like he was killed when his paint exploded or something like that. Like a freak accident that had nothing to do with anything. Like uh, his brushes... Nothing to do with anything. The, the state between his estranged wife and girlfriend took place, all prompted from these drunken, barely comprehensible wills. I can clearly understand the 16.324 in there. Um, I can see art. This statement is null and void if my relationship... No, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Paints, uh... Oof. Being of sound mind and body... I hereby bequeath to Gay Pinto Walsh 100. Bro, that's how Gay Pinto Walsh got his fortune? And Gay Pinto Walsh got one <coughs> or got 10 million in cash for many cargo. Polly, could I give and I give her the house at 15. And 1634Z Rust Corinet Rust Corinth and Avenue for her security the November 18th or 19th, 2011. Just crazy. For anybody who doesn't know uh, Gay Pinto Walsh, you probably know the Monica old GPW, you know. GP dubs, yeah. That's one of the most famous artists in history who never made any art. That's the big meme about Gay Pinto Walsh. But this is where all the money came from. I'm just glad we've solved that mystery. We've been asking that for a while on this show. A purveyor of art is basically an artist. Yeah. Um, Capitalism artist. One of the one of the EFAP favorites, uh, Gay Pinto Walsh. Still trying to get him on the show. Maybe one day. Who knows? Gay Pinto Walsh, if you're still alive, contact Let us, us know. before you overdose on Valium and alcohol. Yeah, don't mix them. Eventually, both parties settled out of court. Just These brain, events are made even more ironic just by going onto YouTube and watching some of the painting demonstration videos he made before his death. The ones where he actually explains his techniques are fine and decently informative, but on others, the man can't do two minutes of actual painting without cutting it off and giving a speech about how God inspired him and how we should all be looking toward the light or something. Mm -hmm. Religious beliefs aside, are you trying to give an informative peek into your process, or are you just going to preach Jesus to the Jesus is part audience? of the process. Considering Jesus is his process. And yeah, it's, it's the old artist mm. song, Jesus Take the Brush. <laughs> Jesus Take the Wheel is always such a funny, like... You, you know, me, it's Jesus. just like, it's such <laughs> terrible advice. <laughs> Please keep your hands firmly secured to the wheel of your automobile. That's when Jesus is like, I am emotion. not taking the... You take. You are the one that's responsible. Let's be clear. <laughs> I just, Jesus just never imagine. got a driver's license. He doesn't know how to drive. <laughs> He's not legally allowed to drive on public roadways. When you say that, I just imagine the scenes in movies where, like, the character takes the heads off the wheel and I'm imagining Jesus in the passenger seat. Like, really stressed out, yeah. <laughs> 
It was bad enough when you were fun. texting. Now you don't even have your hands on the wheel. We're going to meet really soon. <laughs> got one hand over the driver's seat from the back. Like, oh, God, oh, God, I've got this. I'm yeah. like, oh, jeez. Oh, God, you do the pedals. I'll steer. <laughs> the song doesn't say anything about pedals. How interested he was in maintaining his positive image and Christian values, my guess is the latter. If you're still wondering how people could hate a Thomas Kincaid artwork for political reasons, well, it's because the artist himself politicized them. He fueled the rift between the art uh, world and wait, people out there. Sorry, are we, what? I think, okay. Uh, I think it's impossible to not see him as somebody who did a lot to inflame culture wars and to make a lot of money articulating to people that they were on the outside, that people were looking down on them and that the art world was laughing at them. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Side of it. And to be fair, it seems some of the art world fueled this conflict as well. And oh boy, okay. does you don't Thomas gas on that. Opposition It's still doing fine. Hmm? The, the 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 fire. The, oh yeah, the he didn't need to do that. That guy. Yeah, it was clearly already quite voluminously inflamed. Yeah, he, there is no need to awkwardly more, sprinkle gasoline more. on it. No, slightly more voluminous flame. We need it to be more voluminous. Well, perhaps that's why the it's... imagery is perfect for the point of the video, which is that fires were burning, and then people were tossing on a bit more, a uh, bit more petrol, a bit more gas. Objectively speaking, oh, yeah. you are gorgeous. Facts do not care about your feelings. <laughs> that's that's how he could woo a woman. Position get yeah. political. That's how you can get articles like Thomas Kincaid. I don't, yeah, this the, <laughs> the George W. Yes, Bush of art. <laughs> yeah. Wait, funny. didn't yeah? Because uh, George W. Really paints like... himself, right? He he does. I it, thought he yeah, did. This yeah. was, uh, I think this was made before I get into this, but he yeah it, yeah. This this really does feel like a blast. For, when's the last time you heard somebody just say like, "Oh yeah, man, remember like George W. Bush"? Just feels like an old <laughs> like, era, doesn't it? Uh, it which it like is, I guess, era. relatively. Well, yeah, it says 2012, so this was a different era. But it's just like, man, when's the last time you heard someone mention George W. Would you Bush? Like to, would you like to see one of George W. Bush's paintings? We, oh, I, I show. Some yeah, we do. I think in this. Oh. Video. Oh, we do we? All right, I won't spoil the surprise. Wait, did he paint? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, he, he did. Yeah, uh, he became I, a painter. Okay, I didn't know that. George W. Bush of art. Their reasoning? Kincaid, like Bush, peddled a falsely simplified image of the world, and that oh. the same bad. That's not even <laughs> like a like that... a landscape or a. I mean, most any, what any art that doesn't depict horrific suffering people <laughs> is like, not oh, accurate just, to the real world. That's not accurate to the real world. You just it's rose tinted whatevers. Which is funny if someone says like is... Lord of the Rings doesn't represent the real world. It's like you could go to the Shire in New Zealand, so it's true. That's where you could go. It's real, damn it. Don't tell me different. That made people invest in fraudulent galleries, also elected George Bush, and sent their children off to die. In I mean, <laughs> this, <laughs> this, this is the is absolutely insane. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> or, there's even another article titled, Is George Bush a Better Painter Than Thomas Kincaid? Mm, which no. argues that George W. Bush's recent painting escapades are more interesting than Kincaid's work because they are more inventive and emotionally resonant. Oh, it looks like, uh, least, oh, that better. guy in the right. He looks like a Gusto. He looks, I was about oh, to say, Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. He does Anyone look can. like him. Hey, man, maybe George W. is a big fat of Ratatouille. I can see that. He who, is he is. Is. who is he supposed to be, though? Not sure. Everyone's <laughs> a big fan of Ratatouille, except you. Yeah, so I don't know why. People were like, in articles I read, they were like praising George W. Bush's art. I guess because... Like, uh, <laughs> okay. Right, um, I, I mean, the... F a if someone would, you know, like, a, a, if he was, like, learning how to do it, there'd be plenty of criticism yeah. to deliver, but I guess people are gunning for the aspect of just, look at the expression. Like, I, yeah, I, mean, yeah I guess that's what they'd be going for. It's definitely, like, there's a lot of, like, you know, amateur stuff, but I guess it's, like, better than a person who just uh, just started, you know? that There's certainly merit in, there's some volume stuff. Like, the Putin one, I think, is a lot worse than the... Other, say it. Uh, yeah, like the one on the way. The Gusto one. Yes. Say the Gusto one. The Gusto one. Yeah. I think the Chef Gusto is a lot better. You're rewriting just, history here on Eve. A lot. 
Yeah, because a much better grasp of like form. Much to learn, George W. Mm -hmm. still has. But it's you know, I if I saw my kid come up with these, I'd be like, oh, these are great. Look at that. Oh yeah, like if if my <laughs> if my child made these, I'd be like, yo, these are great. You should like seriously pursue, pursue it. Yeah. Career. As Elisa Bennett, they're no gay Pinto Walsh uh, artistry level. It's no gay but, Pinto Walsh, but that's but, a difficult you know, thing to strive toward. Quite bitterly explains in her article, "A Dream from Christmas Cottage." Though Kincaid's paintings often pander to evangelical Christianity, which is probably the most legitimate reason to hate them, the primary reason that the art world has erected aesthetic <laughs> and conceptual barriers around him is one Barricades. that echoes Clement Greensburg's 80-year-old essay yeah. on oh. the avant-garde. Yeah, I, I screwed up Take that it too. down. <laughs> Redo the yeah, whole video, I, damn it. Take down yeah, yeah. your video. We think it's stupid art for stupid people. Mm. That is, wow. those who are too intellectually flabby to spot the... D okay. <laughs> Jeez, calm down. You don't just, like the fact that the guy is into Jesus a lot. You know, like, if you <laughs> okay, ever chill. were just sitting on the old couch and you're watching, like, Bluey, and it's just like, don't steal from people. If someone was like, why aren't you watching fucking, you know, the, the newest... Why aren't you watching uh, Worker and... What was it? The one in the Simpsons? <laughs> Worker and Parasite? Yeah. <laughs> watch, watch, watch Parasite instead of Itchy and Scratchy, you know? Yeah, watch something more challenging. You're like, bro, I'm just... I'm fine. I can I can check out some stuff that's yeah. chill and fun and, and safe and cozy sometimes. That doesn't mean I don't also check out Existential Terror, you know, here and there. <laughs> like, in between my Bluey episodes. The difference okay. between... You know, uh, uh, Gay Pinto Wa Walsh was not uh, intellectually flabby. They were more uh, intellectually <laughs> stiff, I think. You could say that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we, we do yeah. praise a lot of uh, Gay's work, but he, he came under a lot of fire in the 90s, specifically. I don't need to go over all of those events, but... It's, yeah, uh, the Columbine era was pretty... A lot of stiff almost... works, you could say, yes. Yeah, yeah a lot of stiff thought Gay Pinto Walsh came under a lot of fire as well. After he died oh. and went to hell for being gay. What? <laughs> gay Pinto Walsh wasn't gay. What? That's what insane. Is yeah, and the what real you... and a charlatan's flattened approximation of it. Yes, to some, hating a Thomas Kincaid painting has political dimensions to it. But I think a slightly more charitable explanation that is less political and more merit-based comes from the art critic Jerry Saltz. The reason the art world doesn't love Kincaid isn't that it hates love, life, goodness, or God. We may be silly or soulless or whatever, but we don't automatically hate things with faith and love or that other people love. The reason the art world doesn't respond to this person hasn't been to the internet yet. Yeah, there are plenty of people who <laughs> like you go a anyone like, you could imagine. They're happy, out there, and they're like, "Oh, this is I happy. hate happiness. Or, oh, this is somewhat wholesome." Or, "Oh, a man and a woman with a child." Ugh. What is this conservative? I could propaganda? see like a friendly little flower in a field, or I could totally see someone being like, "Where's the blood? Why haven't you? Why, where's the realism?" And you're like, oh. "Where's the blood flowers? Show me." Poppies. Kincaid is because none, not one of his ideas about subject matter, surface, color, composition, touch, scale, form, or skill is remotely original. This might be the most succinct and clear explanation of an aspect of why some people hate his art. It was something I suspected from the beginning, but it was just never actually written down clearly until this man finally gave a beautifully specific reason. Now I agree, in fact, that they are unoriginal in those aspects. But, and I know this is like a... Why did we pause on Edna mode? Uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever someone pauses, I'm like, yes? What did you, was there something? Yeah, uh, hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Okay, okay. I'm losing my mind. Now, I don't know if I completely agree with that, because it's now, like, I'm thinking after, I'm like, okay, unoriginal, but you know, I can recognize a Thomas Kincaid, so even if it's not, like, super unique, there's some sort of style there that he made that I can differenti differentiate from other people, and that's original in a sense, you know? Um, so, I, was, I was trying to think of what I think about those words being used, uh, sort of like the ruling out his work as being able to be described that way, and I was like, how would I apply it if I thought those did apply? And it's like, does it mean just his his works are like always remixes of his works? None of them ever come across as 
um, strictly new. Like, oh wow, he did that. Yeah, I it's think more that's the charitable. Yeah, well, it's more yeah, like he's a reliable like artist that provides you a thing where you're like, that's his stuff, and I like it, and that's fine. Uh, I guess that's because something I will say is that the more that the pictures have been coming up, the more I've been getting bored by them. Um, but like, oh, yeah, I, absolutely. I don't know. But there's, yeah, like I can't it, it, it put it into like words. A, a similar thing over and over and over again, even though there are obviously differences between them. It's just starting to get a little bit boring seeing them. Some of them I like way more than others, but all of them have, the, I think it's like that they share this texture um yeah they they share this um like it's all the same pieces rearranged in a way um it's really tough to say because it's good art i i like it it's pleasant i can imagine living in my little cottage by the lighthouse um but i'm like i but there's something almost um matrixy about it like it, there yeah. is something that's like, a little bit strange about it. It's like because when you show the first the first painting, it's like, oh, okay, it's like a cottage in the woods, okay, and then you see like another cottage in the woods, and, and then another the thousand one, and, one. All, and, the, and then they're all very bright as well. Um, yeah, that's and, and the that's longer the... that it's going on, the more it's starting to be like, hmm, okay. Compared to you know, I guess when you compare it to like the great artists throughout history, right, where there's uh more variety, more dimensions, more uh. Yeah, it's just there's differences. These all feel very similar, and it's starting to get a little bit boring. It's um, it's surprisingly striking, beautiful, and ready to be praised in and among a bunch of other artists' other works. If you saw one of these, just like alongside a bunch of other stuff, you're like, oh wow. But you'd still probably do the thing which everyone does, which is like, that looks just like it would be on a Christmas card. That looks just like it would be on a uh, greetings yeah, card. Yeah, you don't. When you look at these, it, uh... you don't think of these as paintings. You think of them as Christmas cards and puzzles that Which old is people put right? together. It's like it's, there's a level of genericness um, th that and kind I, of yeah. stems from it, which is kind of fascinating to me almost. Have um, they been made generic and it's like, it's not even the fault yeah, of the I, art? I, I, well, no. a, more, well, well, a, a nice guess, way of putting it, you could say, is cozy uh, and, and reliable. Uh, but, kind of, it's safe. I guess yeah, that, I that's, think... almost, that's almost kind of the selling based on. The, like I said, yeah. I really don't know about this guy. Like this is basically the first time I've heard of him. Though I'm guessing that I probably have seen one of these paintings before on a jigsaw. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Like As... Well, so some people um, in chat are now referencing AI and like algorithmically, like it comes across that way, and it's like I think that's where the art world was taking issue with him, was that it comes across as though you see these thousands of paintings in a row. You're like you come across as an algorithm that you you're creating these you're not they're not like expressions of passion in um uh fast angry and or sad or happy it's it's mostly like you know what you're doing you do it you do it well and it's done which and then you combo that up with the business model as well uh and and how successful that business model was uh seemingly it's just i guess what I, what I mean that I don't I don't know much about the business practices, but that it made a lot of money basically, and that a lot of people well, bought the painting. This is why um, combine all together. It's like hmm. I feel like our episode uh, two fifty one was kind of about this. Like we we wanted. I believe there should be a balance, not like a you know on one side you have the people who appreciate the craft in and of uh, you know lighting composition skill, like all of these particular things, divorced entirely from the expression from the artist and then the other side is like no the expression from the artist is all that matters you could have literally a, a you know a fucking a piece of shit on the floor it's just like if i can just read the book that relates to it and find out what it means that's that's what makes true art sort of thing like why couldn't why won't have it be both that we want to have artists that express themselves and their experiences and their lives through artworks that are uh, channeled into like crafts that require skill that create like incredible imagery um, and that each of these things can change the amount you judge the artwork for what it is and stuff instead of like <laughs> this like drawing this weird line where this is either incredible or terrible depending on which of those two you you opt for uh, um, yeah mm. you guys might have uh, uh, just to give you some more information I, I suppose yeah he he basically he has this sort of factory like process um, certainly um, and even even his paintings, like they're technically skilled, but there's like there's like things you can pick apart about them. Uh, like some people pointed these things out to me. Like sometimes the perspective of the houses isn't exactly uh, completely correct, or you know the lighting mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. Um, and like those that, things, 
Yeah, those things like you know, if you're looking at it from like a technical realism like perspective, and it's like okay, I could see why you could find that annoying and stuff. Um, well, and like they're clearly not trying to be realistic, um, but there's oh, still yeah, they're like, like fanciful fairy tale type uh, style. Yeah, at least but there's still the like like errors and like reflections that even then wouldn't really make sense. Mm -hmm. However, you know, I got to give him a little bit of credit. In doing research for this video, I saw like Kincaid copycats and. Oh boy, there are some really bad, <laughs> like really, really sloppy versions. When... Obviously, don't have as much skill. So, like, I kind of appreciate that he's, you know, trained as well. Even if, even if there are small mistakes, the, uh... he's certainly not the worst, technically skilled wise. Another really awkward aspect to it would be: let's take this one for example. If someone said, like, what I hate about his work is that it's all soulless or kitsch, as they were using earlier. There's nothing to this. He paints it almost automatically. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's just trying to make money. No no expression in there. But then, what if there was, like, a full, you know, 10-hour video of him making this, where he talks extensively about his, like, family history, and that all of this is supposed to inform it, that, like, this wonderful, beautiful thing that's perched on the edge of a, uh, the coming waters that are going to engulf it, or at least that was his, like, perspective. It, it, like, if that were true, would that then make this more of a piece of art, which is why I find the whole lore argument a bit, uh, it struggles with me sometimes, it's just like, so the, it doesn't, the image wasn't even relevant at that point, it was like, just whether or not he felt things when he made it, which we can never necessarily know, uh, or not always necessarily know, because as we talked about in that episode, it's like, what if the artist is fucking dead, and there was no record of what he felt when he made the thing, now what? Mm -hmm. That they are unoriginal in those aspects. But, and I know this is like a cardinal sin according to art critics, I don't hate Kincaid's art. There's some paintings I like. Some I wouldn't mind having a print of. Oh, that's of. nice. That's oh, nice. Yeah. I find excessive. Yeah, that one feels a bit busy. Um, <laughs> it, it's, yeah, it's like, um, it's almost like a Where's Waldo yeah. picture. Um, but, like, what, it's busyness is what you have to appreciate, and if you don't, then, like, the image is sort of, like, it's lost. Um, I guess, like, oh, I look guess at all the logic, people doing their stuff. I guess the logic to for this one, or like these kinds of paintings, is that you'd have these in your home. You can spend a lot of time looking at all the little details because yeah. you're like just sitting. There. Yeah, just imagine but yourself it's, it's being too here. Too much for me. It's too much for me. Yeah, I like it, but it is a bit. There's a lot think... going on. Yeah. Oh, that one. Ooh. That one's a bit strange. <laughs> um... <laughs> Yeah. The light, the lightning bird in the top left coming out of yeah, nowhere that's... to be like, what's up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we I don't have think this waterfall. I think this is actually not. I think this is actually made after his death. So it's like this little. Well, yeah, why is that it. Bambi there? Because uh, he has a uh... deal with Disney. Oh, oh. wow. So that, ex then, that, I guess that, ex that explains why he did get in trouble for pissing on Winnie the Pooh. Then yeah, <laughs> yeah, he had he had this. Uh... <laughs> I should have mentioned that actually to give more context. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. It'd be a Quite funny Winnie, baby. Winnie the Pooh is more. Uh, uh, what's the name of the guy who actually made Winnie the Pooh? What was his name? A. A. Uh, Milne. Gay yeah, Pinto Walsh. Right. Oh. No. He, no. No. Gay Gay I mean, Milne. Saying, it's, it's just you know no need no to be bother. pissing on Winnie the Pooh. Right? No, no yeah, need for that. Exactly. No. He, he yeah. just wants to eat his honey. He's a, yeah, he's he a does. quaint little bear who lives in the Hundred Acre Wood oh, with his friends and wants to eat honey. Who I find downright horrendous, but I don't hate everything he has ever painted. People often insult Kincaid's work by calling them greeting card illustrations. I like that, though. That's good. Well, greeting cards oh, need illustrations. Don't... They do, and and they have uh, they, uh, as if we've never picked up a greeting card, God. Huh. And looked at it for a bit and been like, look at that. Look at all the things. Yeah. But I guess... I guess the interesting thing is that part of what's been in this video is, um, like, for instance, if you saw, like, a grandma who had one of these paintings up on the wall and she's just like, ah, oh, it just makes me feel cozy. It makes me feel, nice, you know, at, at home or whatever. And that's why they bought one of these paintings. I feel like it'd just be really weird to be like, wow, you're, you, you like, <laughs> you're, you're such fucker. a stupid idiot. You don't you, know you, anything. You sit grandma down, you boot up sober, and you're like, go. <laughs> like, enough of this Kincaid <laughs> bullshit. Play the game. You know what what I mean? what, there like, never was a coin toss. I don't understand. Like, <laughs> because it's like, like I said, I, I, I find these, like, I, I, I'm getting bored seeing them, but it's like, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't hate these paintings. Like, it's just not, not doing much for me. 
I mean, with each one, I still have a different reaction, if you know what I mean. There's there's enough different... There like, are definitely... They're, yeah, they're not the same. Um, there's similarities that sort of pervade them. I think... Because uh, I assume, um, Solar Sands, you, you picked a lot of these to illustrate particular points you're making at the time, but that you probably could have collected like 20 in a row that are almost indistinguishable in terms of just composition and like the goals yes, he had. I, I tried... Yeah. This is a uh, me trying to like steel man him basically. I I didn't want to just pick the same painting because he he does have different paintings. Mm -hmm. but, uh, well, yeah, that that one of the uh that one that was up before that you said that corresponded with you saying you liked it with all of the 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 path with the autumn trees around it. That yes. was a lot more different to a lot of the ones that have been shown up in the video. Yeah, which yeah, is I think cottage, that's him being a lot more restrained. Yeah. Well, you you almost want to be like, hey. Kincaid, try something else. I just want to see what else you could do because obviously you can yeah, like, you can capture imagery. Like so, why not? Draw one that doesn't have a cottage or mountains. You know, yeah. just give it a shot. Maybe draw like a desert. Try drawing a desert. You know, Ooh. or just even as simple as just like look at this lion. Draw it. I want to see what you yeah, do. I, there's a uh, there's paintings. There's all kinds of like parodies. There's there's one that has a a star destroyer looming in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I would That's love there to be a star that. destroyer. There. <laughs> Yeah. Just there's some you could uh, let me I can look it up and that almost seems like something that would be worthwhile to do is like you can do your painting, but there's like this one element that you have to incorporate into it that is like really, really, really out yeah. of the left field. I need you to make five nights in Freddy's paintings. Hey man. That that kind of could be interesting, you know? What is King Cade's take on Five Nights of Freddy's? Let's see what he's got. Wholesome Five Nights of Freddy's. I'm sure there's plenty of people who've done that already, but hey. Don't they? Or else they would just be white pieces of folded paper with text. And hate them or love them, <laughs> his paintings fit that purpose. You aren't going to find academic history paintings or basquet art on Get Well Soon cards. That would be tonally incongruous. I guess there's people out there that would find that reassuring, but... <laughs> it just, yes, that would be weird. If, you, if that picture was on Get Well Soon, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I always think that'd be like kind of, that's kind of that's kind of funny. <laughs> Don't let this demon get you now. Cottage. If the man had just accepted that his art wasn't going to be seen. As oh my god! Look at that. <laughs> oh my god! This gracious. Peer out your little fanciful cottage, like oh jeez, <laughs> oh god. Oh, there's the empire again. There's the empire. Just in time for Christmas and high-class museums, maybe the kind of vicious hatred for his art from the art world still seen today would be reduced. I think people can be overly critical of his art, but the man also fueled that conflict. What is Thomas Kincaid's legacy? Can a man be defined by his worst attributes? Was he really just a hack that used religion and falsely soothing images to swindle people out of their money? Or was he a flawed businessman of faith? that produced art that may not be wholly original, but tried to instill some sort of simple beauty in an ugly world, who in moments of weakness succumbed to his worst tendencies. I can't really give you a good answer, but Kincaid will certainly not be the last of his kind. John McNaughton has been described as the Thomas Kincaid of Christian nationalism. His paintings are some of the most overtly political and excessive oil. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Trump. Through the snake as well. <laughs> the snake he's, sta he's stepping There's on the snake. snake in my boot. No, oh, wait, no, no, he's stepping on, on it. Oh, he's stepping on it. I see. Yeah. No, don't snap on snake. Unless snake was paintings dangerous. Of all paintings time. out, some of them. Yeah. There. And like Kincaid. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, look at him. <laughs> Jesus, like, what's up? They are. Yo, what's up, competent. soldiers? I wouldn't say they are. <laughs> 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 this is. We sure do love watching Donald Trump drive by on his yeah. breathtakingly yeah. skillful, but he's probably a better painter than most people. Now, whether you agree or disagree oh my politically, well, you have to admit that, that these paintings are a I bit so. much. As in, they are extremely dramatic and far from subtle in their. Who's messages. the guy crying there? Who's that meant to be? No, it's probably no. one of those ideas. It's probably some it's like you have figure piece of shit. Some fucker. Some idiot. I do like the um 
I find these very funny. Like the, I it almost evokes more emotion out of me these than the uh, Kincaid ones, obviously. <laughs> yeah, but, like, yeah, yeah. Ones. yeah. <laughs> they're so expressive. There's so much happening. But it's still art. In fact, not only is it art, it's fascinating oh art. It reveals the inner psyche of the artist and the zeitgeist of large swaths of the American population. These yeah. paintings aren't just some crude Photoshop that your <laughs> grandpa shared on Facebook. These are huge canvases Jihad that squad. required technical skill, planning, and time. They True. contain all the nuance of- Oh, I know that one. Ben Garrison. Yeah, he's... <laughs> I always see his pop up. Political cartoons, but upgraded to far more detailed, loosely realistic paintings. Yeah, painting cartoons. They're also, cartoons. by definition, propaganda. In his work, Legacy of Hope, he combines dozens of figures from history together, comforting Donald Trump, I suppose. Many who would downright hate each other. And whether you agree Yeah, with but we can all agree on Trump. And they Trump all got together for the fucking that. painting, okay? That was the deal. Yeah, that means a lot. Gay Pinto Wall, she set it all up, got them all together. Oh, this picture's got Trump there sitting there making <laughs> the painting. I like his expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can awesome. Let me show you this art that I made. It's it really makes you ever. think. I know it, you know it, we all know it. ...or not, you have to admit they are ripe. For meme material. Oh my god. And I don't know about you. <laughs> the McDonald's of my art is not constitutional. The McDonald's. McDonald's one. <laughs> Ronald <KFC>. McDonald. <laughs> He's painting KFC. The one with Putin as well. <laughs> but I think that has a value on its own. I also find this quote from McNaughton quite fascinating. I'm just honestly a oh. little perplexed. I oh, have well, you're no reading, idea okay. where buyers are yeah, hitting them. Yeah. I just know I sell a ton. Sometimes I'm shocked at how many I sell. What? That one I told you about. <laughs> what is <laughs> so playing the fiddle while the <laughs> white hat the gap of building are on fire? <laughs> <laughs> <What the fuck>? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, Bama, I don't remember your door, Dad, but... <laughs> I'm doing this document when I drone strike that guy. God. Oh. Sell. So. That one I told you about, Obama burning the Constitution. When I painted it, I worried, this thing is just hideous. Why would anybody hang that in their living room? It's not, he says, the kind of warm, happy work. Imagine seeing that and someone's yeah. like, I wonder what your opinions are. Like, I could just now imagine this, like, step into my humble abode and it's just filled with these paintings. <laughs> Like, wall to wall. wall. You can barely even see the walls. And you're like, what do you want to talk about? And you're like, I feel like I know you. <laughs> like, I mean... this, is, this is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because it's, uh, because obviously the comparison is being brought to the other guy, and it's like, this is kind of interesting because it's similar and different. Yes. Because it's like, it is. Out there. It, uh... this isn't like warm and happy necessarily. <laughs> Some of these are. <laughs> Some of these are incredibly critical, which is like, yeah. so it's kind of, it's kind of different to just the cottage in the forest with all of the light beaming over it, you know? Yeah, and the oh, criticism yeah. would likely be like, there's no subtext, it's all just over. Um, well, I mean, we, I mean, compared to the, the other comics by that other dude, right, that have all the text on there, it's like, I guess they're a little bit more subtle than that. Yes, yeah. It's almost like, you have so much text on this picture, why did it need to be a picture? Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. just. Make a little Just poster. Tell me what to think. <laughs> People typically want in their homes. This is where McNaughton and Kincaid diverge. McNaughton does not seem to be as interested in making money. And I find it fascinating that he's like, why are people buying these? These are insane. <laughs> he has like self awareness. <laughs> and he just keeps making them and they yeah, keep Yeah, they just keep going, I guess. <laughs> At least appears to have some self-awareness that his work will likely not be accepted as high art. However, McNaughton may be a sign of something greater. Maybe Kincaid will eventually win his museum bet, but not in his lifetime. In some bizarre twist of fate, museums of the future may display his work in the context of the beginning of a movement of populist conservative art. They may be seen as not aesthetically or emotionally significant, but historically significant. And who knows, maybe the tides of the art world will change and Thomas Kincaid's work will be seen in a new respectable light. I have my doubts, but art critics have been wrong wow, before. Later. Unlike others, apparently, I cannot bring myself to feel joy in this man's death. The life of Thomas Kincaid... Well, I just, I find that, I always find it weird. It's rare that the death of someone is like a, a joyous occasion, even if you really don't like him, just like, it's just, uh... It, I mean, his his art, what was it, a cultural nightmare it was considered by a lot of people? It's just yeah. like, damn. 
a long national nightmare is over. Yeah. Is a life of tragedy. The man had talent, and dishonest or not, attempted to bring some sort of positivity into the world, but was stunted by greed and mass appeal. It seems he wanted to be loved by everyone, and when he wasn't, he turned hostile. He preached he about like family Jesus values and God, and yet endangered others, was killed prematurely by the hand of his own addiction, and left his family fighting for his legacy because of his failed relationships. His brand was one of optimism, faith, and comfort. His paintings were serene, peaceful, perfect scenes without pain or suffering. Ironically, his life was anything but. Behind the artificiality of these idyllic scenes is the all-too-real reality of human folly. I wonder if there are any paintings where you might be able to detect something like that. And that would be the thing I'd probably want to talk to him about if there was anything I could talk to him about. It's like, do you ever feel an interest in expressing tragedy in your works and i wonder because judging from his works i probably i imagine he'd say like why the fuck would i do that you know like what's, what would be yeah. the point of that and i'd be like oh interesting i guess now i really think i mean i i don't know if his name is that big but i think it'd be fascinating if someone made like a a dramatized movie of him because he kind he almost had a rock star lifestyle for a little bit there and you could like explore all the little angles of how this happened the, but, you uh, can do the secret works of Kincaid, and it's like he actually, for every nice and positive one, he drew like a really tragic role one that he kept in a vault. Oh, no he put in the basement, yeah. yeah. And like uh, Nicolas Cage has got to go find them. Be um, pretty good, I think. The like the Declaration of Independence. I have to steal the lost Kincaids. I have to steal the Obama burning the <laughs> Declaration of Independence, or whatever the fuck. <laughs> Constitution. It's just, it, it, there's plenty of potential for movies here. We gotta, we gotta get them all. Whole series yeah, this must be explored. That was a good video, by the way. That was interesting. Yeah, I really uh, like that video. I was gonna. I didn't One know of the better was... ones we've had on EFAT. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, often good. um we don't we don't often cover what we would consider good videos. So that was neat. That was different. Uh, thank you very much. And I feel oh, informed upon the subject. Thought uh, I got the EFAP approval. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, <laughs> it's a rarity, but good stuff. What yeah, precious camp. And I feel like you were pretty fair, um, which can be difficult these days because there's very strong opinions as you already laid out for uh, certainly this topic. And then when it comes to art too, right? Like trying to be like, okay, this image evokes X, and then someone's like, no, it doesn't. And You're like, okay. 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 So, so to get the story clear, so there was this video, and then and then Charlie the watched it, watched this video, and, and he then shot on. Prompted he shot on modern artists because of that, and then Ethan is online yeah. saw it and said, "How is it, Charlie, that you're saying things that have been said in Prager U videos?" <gasps> oh yeah, yeah, that's right. And it was now like, "What?" Yeah, now it's time to come back. And remember, we were yeah. the Prager U videos, the clips we saw, they weren't that bad. They were just like Prager U could be insane, fine. but they like were... they were fine. Yeah, a lot the of the ones stuff about art, fine. the artist guy. The, yeah, I'm trying to remember. He still said some weird there shit. Was... Um, he there was did. one guy. Oh, yeah, one he said guy some things said of value. A lot of normal stuff, and then there was one guy who was more of a mixed bag. But like, I've seen things. crazier stuff from PragerU than that. That's that's like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's relatively mundane. The, um, the artist that Ethan is online was shitting on, and that was the spokesperson for PragerU. Yeah, uh, you know the one with the super detailed figures and yeah, stuff. They, yeah, paintings are crazy. I I can't believe this He's is like that was like the first artist. time I saw. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, he was like gunning yeah, for him. Yeah, he was like an actual artist. He was like a Maxfield yeah. Parish kind of. He said like, yeah. "Have you tried ever drawing something that isn't a person or a tree or something?" I can't remember. It was like, "Wow, way to summarize these images." <laughs> like, is been oh, sure, I guess. He was just Very shitting all over the, them. Oh, like, he's on Prager U. I I have to hate his art because he's Prager U guy. Instead of being like, I don't agree with many of his political opinions, but the man can draw. Yes, he could. Yeah. Um, but yeah, good stuff. So, I feel like context is complete. We've done the whole yeah, journey. Arguably, this video started uh, the entire, like, Charlie, your, your guys' reaction to it. The big the long origin. trail. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, um, like I said, I think there's room for Ethan online to make his response and to try and, like, you know, provide the alternative point of view, but, like, that video sucked ass. Um, mm-hmm. It, I'd say it's one of the worst that we've covered. Um, I always hesitate I, to say that. <laughs> because... I know, but I still, I still think it's one of the worst. 
I don't know. That wisecrack one on the trolley problem was pretty bad. Pretty awful. I feel like all the writing mm. advice ones we cover are insanely bad as well. Mm. I don't know which one's like. I think my favorite EFAP is the one where you cover the guy who shits on Lord of the Rings. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, he I has a favorite. He has since made a new Lord of the Rings review I've been made aware of. Um, I believe well, in, inspired at least partially to, to want to make a new video based on us reacting to the old one. As far as I know, he's, he's still very much on board and happy and fine and chill with the with our reaction, because uh, obviously we're fans of Lord of the Rings, but yes, 93... Yeah, I like it. 93 is often referenced as the favorite episode, but it's between that one, the Synthetic Man one, and the Rise of Skywalker one, I think. Those are the, uh, the fan top. The, the 93 is still, is still fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, all the, all the bizarre editing... And yeah. The fucking Nostalgia Critic references, and Harry, and, like, bringing up Harry Potter... Oh man, I love it. So oh fuck yeah, I, I forgot he kept titles. comparing to Harry Potter. <laughs> it feels so one. weird. 93. Yeah. We're on 254. I like Come that. such a long way. So many, so many pieces of media covered. Wonderful pieces of media, by the way. I would never want to uh, undermine that, of course. Such great and epic adventures. Including, uh, not yeah. limited to, by the way, for people who don't know, we've been covering Saw this month. It's, that's been uh, a whole journey. Which is funny because it's a journey that we did a year ago. But for you guys, it's right now! That's exciting. Yeah. We're also covering newer things this year for Halloween. But you won't know about that until next that's year. That's right. Yeah, silly next little year, you'll learn what we're watching this year. They're actually, uh, the next one is going to be Saw 6. You know, they just had five, so it's gonna be like, ah, that'll be the one. Oh, Which for a lot of people, the, yeah, I've seen some good. comments saying people are looking forward to seeing what we think about uh, Saw 6. Saw 6? Ooh, mm. well, I guess they'll find out in how many days for your little fucked up X on the <laughs> when does the next one come out? Oh, uh, that'd be Wednesday, I think. So it was a bit of a gap now. I say that as if. You got you, you EFAP fans, have you, have you been noticing lately? You've been getting all of the stuff. All that, all that Ahsoka of juice yeah. came right out. Oh, yeah. Fucking Ahsoka, oh. bro. Bro, Ahsoka... <laughs> oh, it, it, it's actually a, a super annoying to me. Because I, uh, I watched uh, The Clone Wars when I was, like, a kid. And, like, The Clone Wars isn't very well written. But, man... Uh, you know, Ahsoka used to be an actual character. He actually had, like, a personality. And in this one, she's just, like, a... Just, just a fucking bank of wood. She doesn't do anything. She used to be like sometimes she smirks so much and more sometimes energetic. She crosses her arms. The smirking and crossing the arms is like that's a personality. Not, that's ba that's barely any. That's like a, a, a what shadow of what what she was. I don't know why Dave Filoni just made her like Doesn't this obnoxious monk. It was crazy as well because I don't know, it is kind of weird. That was getting um, shared excessively. The fact that she folded her arms and I was just like, man, I guess that really does work. Like, it'll make you fill in the blanks, I guess. Which uh, that quote about Kitsch had that near the end that it's like it'll it'll have people believe what they're seeing is a hell of a lot deeper than it actually is. There's so little to draw out of it. I don't know if you guys saw it, but I was tweeting about it because I saw Disbrew tweeting about it that. IGN did a review semi recently in summary of uh, Ahsoka saying it is a season filled with basically nothing but uh, extended scenes of like pauses that are, that add nothing or jangling keys <gasps> to sort of keep you going. It's just like, oh my god, it's been a while. Even but, IGN, uh, yeah, even I IGN. I guess the Disney the check didn't clear. It, it does feel weird to see like big publications repeating talking points that we've been like running with for years. Like, holy shit, they're catching up. I never thought they would, to be honest with you. Um, the And I say, they're talking points that like uh, around all of our spheres for a long time. We've definitely been pushing the Jangly Keys thing since at least Mando Season 2 finale, but I want to say earlier than that, because it was all of Mando Season 2 in general, right? Like, that was the key jangling season. They had, obviously, yeah. Bo-Katan, Boba Fett, um... Luke. Luke. <laughs> yeah, Luke would be a big one. Ahsoka was a key jaggle in that season, and now she's, uh... Isn't that, isn't that crazy? It's like, oh, I love to see her, there she is, oh man, she had her own show, and then it's just nothing. It's absolutely nothing. I don't get it, because... Uh, she used to actually be, like, 
like clever too and like in like curious about things i i i'm i'm going off my memory i i, I watched it i watched the entire show for a video i made on my channel and with this she's just nothing completely nothing i don't understand how anyone is really happy with this even the clone wars fans also um i was actually going to suggest since uh we are only we are only an hour and 44 minutes in uh, would you mm -hmm. guys want to check out that IGN review? It's in video form. Oh, oh yeah, let's give it a look. Really? Cool. Holy shit. I'm curious, yeah. Because normally called, IGN uh... just, you know, passes out the sevens and above for all the corporate sponsors. Yeah, because um... the video is called The Ahsoka Season Finale Reminds Us What's Wrong with Star Wars. Which, uh... Uh... Mm. That's, that's one, thing, one other thing I want to mention is that I think Dave Filoni has always had this problem with making the bad guys stupid and incompetent <laughs> you could say that about his heroes as well and is here about making everybody an idiot but especially the villains well one thing um, i like saw the... uh just yeah, yeah. really quick one thing i saw about a video assessing ahsoka versus the clone wars versus like rebels and stuff is that a lot of people are not as aware as they should be of just how much feloni did uh in terms of his writing versus show running and that we should be careful to assume that almost all the best writing decisions in Clone Wars and Rebels, whatever they may be, uh, that they get given to him, like credited to him. Uh, meanwhile, uh, of course, uh, Ahsoka, we know, written and in some cases directed by him, like this was his baby sort of thing, and that this should be probably the best representation, especially being it's brand new, of his abilities as an artist. And I was like, that's probably true. Uh, current abilities, I, certainly. I, I did not know that. Uh, I, 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 had, I had no clue. I thought Filoni was heavily involved in Clone Wars, but then yeah. I saw someone lay it out, and I was like, oh shit, is writing credits for them. I think it's only like the newest season or something? It was It was again. the lighter that it went on, the more credits he got. Like, the lighter, the longer that the show went on. And I don't want to... I don't want to undermine his contributions. For all I know, he's responsible for some of the, like, best payoffs in the show, as far as I'm aware. Like I said, I haven't seen it, and I haven't checked all the credits, but I remember just watching a video that was like, be careful to credit a lot of different things to him, because uh, you need to check who actually did the stuff, because a lot of people don't get credited where they should. Um, mm -hmm. Which is fair. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, it just, I don't know, it just seems like Ahsoka, like the bad parts of Ahsoka are like a spiritual successor to the bad parts of Clone Wars. Because in Clone Wars, you'd, you'd frequently have these scenes where, like, a uh, Jedi would be facing, like, 80 battle droids. And the battle droids would just run up shooting their lasers. And, the Je and like, Anakin or something would just mow them all down. I'm like, great. <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just weird. Alright, are you guys ready? Yeah. It's gonna be exciting. One of us isn't in the room, apparently. It's so oh. the sands, wow. Betrayal. I forgot. I'm, not, left. I'm not in the... Left. Disgusting. Oh, I thought, it, I thought you have to make a new link this? every time. No, it's the same one. Back. Same one, yeah. Oh, back. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Spoiler alert! All right, All right everybody in All chat, right. oh, if you oh were looking, to be spoiled. I know you've been watching Ahsoka, you haven't finished it yet, you gotta get out of here now, you're about to have it spoiled. Oh god, the spo this is, when you have a friend who hasn't seen Ahsoka and they're like, please, please don't spoil it, you're like, oh god, because, yeah, oof, you'd miss, oh, just At imagine. Least two things that happen. I don't even, what would be the genuine spoilers? Okay. Anakin shows spoil up. Both things that happen. As a spoilers ghost. For the finale yes. of Ahsoka, or the whole season? Do you mean? Just the whole. Well, at that point, you could argue it's the whole season. But yes, uh, what would be the whole seasons? What What are the th um, If you wanted to spoil Ahsoka as a show to someone but who hasn't seen it, how would you do it? And how, uh, how, how the being, fastest way possible? Use the force. That'd probably be the big spoiler, right? Thrawn is back in the Star Wars universe. Oh, yeah, Sabine Thrawn can use the back. Force. Anakin shows yeah. up as a Force ghost. That's probably it. That's right. That's those are the main ones. Um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe our oh, Ezra. He's he got saved. You know. It's so funny because like it starts to get a little like, do do I even bother mentioning this? Is like, yeah, Soka's not in the regular galaxy now. But as you highlighted when we watched it, it's like that will ultimately be highly beneficial for her by the time we. I like how if you said that to someone, she's not in the regular galaxy now, they'd be like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" Yeah. Well, and it's just and it's, it's weird as a talking point. You're like, okay, wh and what does that mean, dude? 
What what the the thing that I find interesting is if the show doesn't get a second season, which let's be real, that's entirely possible. Like the viewership was not amazing. Yeah. Um, and that show was probably pretty expensive. If they don't do a second season of Ahsoka, then that means that all of the plot points that I imagine that they're setting up there may go unresolved. And Ooh. I don't know. That seems like that might be a good thing, given that they're delving into like all the Mortis stuff. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, you know what? Maybe we I. We, we've talked about this before, chat might remember, that conversations about the idea of accepting certain aspects of Star Wars as canon or not, for me, Ahsoka's like a really easy one to essentially, like, let, let's put it this way, when I'm watching Empire and, and Lucas fighting Darth Vader, there is no part of my mind that's thinking, yeah, and also there's Ahsoka who will at some point in this world um, go to an interdimensional plane that connects, like, timelines and then go to another galaxy by riding in the mouth of a star whale to go fight, like, a bunch of Night Sisters and zombie stormtroopers. That, that's just not... There's no, there's don't, no world um, where that, like, in my mind, is a thing that actually occurred in this universe. Oh, no. Hell no. No. No, 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 no. There, Dude, there, I'm, yeah. I'm so worried that Star Wars, if it keeps going like this, will start doing multiverse shit. I think mean, we yeah, heard that's if, the rumor that's Anakin... the plan with that stupid Will Between Worlds shit. Oh, I mean... That really? might be their vehicle to get Anakin, especially if Hayden Christensen's like, yeah, I mean, you know, I could work. Like, I could. But if Anakin didn't work. become Darth Vader, ooh. And then they bring him oh, in no. so that he can actually be part of the story more long term, possibly. I mean, the thing that I, <laughs> the fact that the fact that the grand plan for Thrawn is to create an army of zombie stormtroopers, like that's great. Um, when I think about that, I kind of wonder. It's like. Do they know what they're doing? You know, do they actually... Is this meant to be, like, an allegory of some kind for, like, the shambling corpse that is Star Wars? You know, just getting brought Mind back from the dead. But then again, it's like, it might just be that Dave was like, nah, man, like, zombie stormtroopers is cool. Like, that there is no commentary at all. That's where the, the thought like, begins no, and terminates. Yeah, was there was no commentary cool. on the side of Star Wars that, like, this is the only way that it can be imagined to continue is by just, re re like, reviving the dead. And then having them shamble around, you know. But no, I think it's just they want zombie stormtroopers. I dude, he really I reminds that. me of Zack Snyder. Um, um you know I... what the way that I've described it is like if you imagine, like Dave Filoni is like a he's like a twelve, thirteen year old ideas of storytelling, and Zack Snyder is more like a fifteen or sixteen year old. That's kind of the way that I imagine it. Snyder's a bit more edgy, he thinks he's a bit more profound in terms of, like, the, the kinds of stories he's telling, whereas to me, Dave definitely feels like throwing his toys at each other, you know? These are my toys, and Ahsoka's my OC, and then they, you know, they fight each other, and they have their lightsaber battles, and then the ships fly around and blow each other up, you know? That's how I, that's kind of... Yeah, because would... Snyder will, like, rip out Superman's heart and show it to the screen and be like, look at this... Meanwhile, yeah, Filoni is, will be like, like you lost, know, protecting you know? all of his children all the time, yeah. and be like, they yeah. made it in the end. Oh, look, that was scary. Ooh, that could have been bad. Here they go. Off they are. Mm -hmm. Yay, we did it. That sort of stuff. So there are similarities, but I, yeah, I, <laughs> I give Snyder more credit than I'd give Filoni. Let's put it that way. Oh God, I think I might agree, which is really awkward, isn't it? But it's like, oh, uh, it is mm. awkward. But I just. Especially, it might just be because Ahsoka's fresh in my mind, and I had to spend a lot of time. It could with be that, that yeah. And I really do hate that show. Um, I, I could see us like when we finish up Filoni being like, "Yeah, okay, Snyder's bad, but at least Snyder actually tries to do a thing and um, fails at it." Know, and then, but I if like we finished Snyder. up watching Filoni, uh, sorry, Snyder recently, we might have said, "Yeah, Filoni's bad, but at least like he's you know inoffensive." Meanwhile, Snyder will do things um, that are fucking crazy and insane. Yeah, I guess it's. I, I guess the thing I do like three hundred. You know, <laughs> when was the last time you watched it, Fringy? We didn't we rewatch it like did we watch it for like an EFAP movies where the the takeaway was that it was like pretty flawed, but I still like that movie. Well, so you know what's crazy is I'm pretty sure we did, but you were there. I, I'm not sure what it was. I definitely <laughs> recently like rewatched three hundred. I say recently in the last couple of years. And I'm confident my takeaway was like, yeah, it's pretty flawed, but like, yeah, so I do like it. Um, well, the, that is the first EFAP movies of the war arc, so you guys are going to be able to see that in January. But um, 
at this point, uh, I rags, I feel like you may feel the same way. I can't quite remember anything we said <laughs> like anymore. I, it's been I a while. Think, I think I don't hate it. I don't think. I don't um, think I hate it either. I, but I hate I, it. I thought I thought it had some neat little things in there, mm. but it wasn't good. Also, I, I no. The point I'm making wait, just to clarify, what? you're not getting the whole walk in January. It's going to be across the year, one per month, or maybe two. That's the that's the plan. I've talked about this like even two years ago. Okay, this, we're finally launching. That's actually why, by the way, that uh, things are stretched thin is because I'm putting everything in place to complete the war arc ready for uh, January. It's not finished yet, still. But hey, it's going to be fun. Get excited. Also, Fringy, carry on. <laughs> what were we say? Oh, damn. Well, because we're trying to figure out. It's like, if, if, we can, if we can say that Dave Filoni and Snyder are comparable in a certain way, mm -hmm. who do we think? Who, who do you think if, if, you, if it's like you had to be forced to... Let's put it this way. They're, they're working on something new now, and it's whatever they want to make. Like, they're full carte blanche. They can make whatever they want. Not attached to any specific franchise. Uh, uh, but maybe it is. It's exactly what they want to make, and they have all of the resources to fully realize that story. Which one would you rather watch? The Snyder one or the Filoni one? So it, you could just say, like, do you want to see Rebel Moon, or do you want to see, let's just say, whatever sci-fi project that's... Movie. Well, not, not removed from Star Wars, a Filoni work oh, that's sure, entirely what he sure. wants. Which, funnily enough, if he got entirely what he wanted, it probably would be a Star Wars movie. That's probably what he wants. Yeah, um, that's probably. Kind of my mind. In any case, yeah. uh, yes, I would rather see the Snyder film Zach just Snyder? because of the fact that I don't know what I'm going to get. This could be crazy. Mm -hmm. And it also could there have some might... stuff in there I like. Yeah, there yeah. could be some neat shots. There's there that could too. be some uh, interesting... I, do consider, I certainly consider yeah. Snyder to have a better eye than Dave Filoni. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think he's got a better... Well, I don't want to be pretentious. And dull and boring but dare I say, watch. Snyder's more of an artist than Filoni is. Uh, I, yes, he is. I would, I would absolutely say that. Yeah, okay, definitely. Yeah, good. I didn't think Snyder I was crazy is, for a second there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, Snyder's no, shitty, crazy. but just, he is an artist. He's cringe. That's that's his thing. It's not. He is he, cringe. I, I believe that he does have a passion for storytelling. I just think that it's cringe. <laughs> like fifteen-year-old cringe is way less cringe than thirteen-year-old cringe. <laughs> Bear. <laughs> and agreed. And on the topic of Ahsoka, let's check out yeah. what IGN thought. It's going to be a funny little uh, uh, ending to this as well. Um, mm -hmm. just, that was a bit of foreshadowing, but yeah. It's October. Wait, it's you, the you know week what, of actually, Friday. Stop. Wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. Wait. Here's, here's an idea. Let's before we before we watch the finale. Let's find out what IGN gave us. No, that was going to be the end. joke ending. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> we'll do okay, that at the okay. end. Okay? okay, we'll we'll okay, go sure. into this as a wide-eyed, bushy-tailed viewer <laughs> who's like, "Oh, look, this is tail. this is IGN's opinion on Ahsoka for sure." Okay, this is what it is. All right. It's October, it's the week of Friday the 13th, and I'm a huge horror nerd. As you'd expect, I'd previously planned on this edition to be focused on all of the delightful tricks and treats of the season. Unfortunately, Remember I still can't get the Remember when they manifested the sword? Uh, Remember yeah, but to be fair, that, it was the sword of Talzin, relation to Mother Talzin, right. who if you watch the show, you'd find that that's substantive now because you recognize the name. Yeah, that's right. She that's put how a that curse works. On Count Dooku, Why did they have General to do Grievous that? Went along they just gotten like a sword out of a chest. So wouldn't... I'm not even kidding. Like I actually think that that's partly the plan. Sometimes it's like maybe originally it was just a sword, and then they were like, "Can we name it something so that fans have something to think while this scene is happening?" Call it the Sword of Talzin. That'll do it. And even if, I don't, like, I'm not saying that it wasn't the Sword of Talzin, what I'm trying to say is that, like, there's nothing actually there other than it's that thing you know from that other thing. There's nothing of interest by that sword belonging to Mother Talzin or whatever. So it's like, what? Even for the people who are familiar with her, which, by the way, Dave, hello, like, most people are not familiar with this. You need to help him out just a little bit taste of Ahsoka's season finale out of my mouth, so we'll be spending more time on the spooky stuff later this month. For now, right. the trick we're Remember going to talk him. about is the one Remember that- Mor Remember Morak. Remember Rock. What a great and character. And then how he was turned into blood. green dust, and then <laughs> is gone. <laughs> yeah, we thought- Remember how we thought, oh, well, maybe they'll make another one. It's like, nope, he was just there to be, like, nope. the mini-boss. Can we go cynical the, and be like, point. Dave, you gotta kill somebody with a lightsaber this season. Something's gotta happen. Oh, he's yeah, like, I was sure. just about to say that. Yeah, he's there so they can, that they can have a consequence-free lightsaber kill. So lame. Oh. Mm -hmm. I don't really understand and like 
So he's like magic. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's like a, he's a spell in human form in or something. Suit, yeah. Spell. Oh, and then he died. <laughs> I mean, he they could... like cast him. How does how does a casted spell person well, die? Because I was actually going to say, how is it that a lightsaber stops the spell? Why would that happen? Yeah. Oh. Uh, they just like immediately make another. It's not a very good one. They well, they didn't make another one. He was just there. To, that was it. It's yeah. Like it's a consequence uh, less kill. Basically, like Rag said, it's crazy because it would be like, wait, can you, can you do that multiple times? Can you just make force users with lightsabers? That's just a I thing mean, you can do. do that I mean, we know you can clone them, but this is just the magic version. God, mm -hmm. baloney, why? The whole of Ahsoka played on the audience. This never happened before. No, this is this showcases some of Star Wars' biggest problems. Okay. Lucky us. I think uh, I agree with that sentiment. So let's see where she goes with it. At the beginning of the season, I wrote, can Ahsoka survive being Rebels Season 5? Amazingly, that didn't end up being its problem, at least not its biggest one. Ahsoka wasn't hamstrung by being a fifth season of a show not everyone watched, or people not- Yeah, because I actually think that's a bit of a myth. A lot of people are like, you didn't watch Rebels, and it's like, you didn't- Watching Rebels would change nothing about how much is in this show. Yeah. It seems like all it would do is present contradictions because people are acting out of character. If, That's what Theo is pointing out. The way it would look if it were coming across as bad because we hadn't seen Rebels is if there was loads of context that we missed as to why certain things were happening. But most of the exactly. fucking Rebels fans didn't know why certain things were happening. Well, it would be like if you watched season four of Breaking Bad and you hadn't watched seasons one, two, and three. It's just like you're in the middle of a story. You just get dropped into the middle of a story that's playing out, you know? The crazy thing, though, is you probably could get along. Like, and then, probably. you know, you'll, you'll be probably. like, oh, they're referencing this older stuff that I don't know about, but I mean, you know kind of move on with it but... but at the same time you you would you would be disoriented from the get-go well, um you know when when you're like uh what the fuck is with, like like when they draw all this information out of that droid that shouldn't even have been there like all this stupid convoluted coincidences and stuff you don't go like yeah but you haven't seen rebels yeah exactly. that doesn't it change doesn't really anything shit. when when hera says i'm a general so nothing is off the limits to me it's like i don't seeing rebels does not help that that doesn't that doesn't mm -hmm. Like, that's just stupid in and of itself. Uh, that, that's what I mean. The most scenes, there's just nothing. And it's not like Rebels helps yeah, the people... fact that there's nothing here. You no, know, it really exactly. contextualizes those long moments Nothings. of silence. Understanding some of the character motivations, or who other characters were entirely. In the end, the problem was that whether it was called Ahsoka Season 1 or Rebels Season 5... Just ready a tracking device. It didn't end up being a season of that? television. What was that edit? Uh, Why did you show that clip? Is it just because Chopper, he's from Rebel? I guess, yeah, if, if that's that, that it, but that's a bit That of... was an awkward, bad edit, sorry. I thought she was going to play a clip that was like an answer was... to her statement from the show. Yeah. But no, I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> no answers <laughs> here. Go on. Instead, it was individual nostalgia plays sprinkled through long patches of... Nothing. Well, nothing. Nothing. That is troubling. Nothing. And what makes that so frustrating is that creator Dave Filoni absolutely rocks at delivering. No. <laughs> no. He doesn't no. Rock at anything. At not it rocks at nothing. Well, oh, let's. Sorry, you cut it off. Yeah, I was gonna. Say, I did cut her off because I mead. Let's see what she said. Maybe I'll yeah. agree with her. Rocks at delivering impactful, emotional, engaging, and most importantly, original Star Wars stories. What? Oh, no. What? You're no, mad. No. Nope. Why would you show this image when saying original? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come on. This is, not original. this is not original in multiple ways. First of all, Darth Vader, character he didn't create, so there's that. Then there's also the fact that this is a flashback to another show that already exists. And then, it's of course, there's the fact that the imagery story. has been used, like, by every Many director times. that's ever that's fucking tackled point. Star Wars at this point. Yeah. It's, it, it's like, it is layers of unoriginality here. Mm -hmm. It's kind of incredible, isn't it? Why didn't, why, didn't, at... uh, why didn't she just show, like, Ahsoka? That's his character, I guess. Yeah, there, there are... If I was asked to show a visual for saying he knows how to make, like, original stories and stuff or whatever, I'd just be like, yeah, just show Ahsoka with Anakin Ghost in the Clone Wars. Something. Well, uh, yeah, Ahsoka and Sabine, Ahsoka, two originals in an original yeah. scene from an original show. Like, it's like, yeah. Exactly. Even, even the Sith people, I mean, they look... They're like, they're yeah, like Balin is, uh, he's kind of original, I guess. 
He's Brandon. an original character, and he's a little bit less archetypal, I guess. Slightly. You, Slightly less. You almost archetypal. want to say like he's uh, he's pretending to be non-archetypal. <laughs> like that's yes. what's going on there. At least he usually does. I want to be clear. I love the character Ahsoka. Harrison Dula, criminally underused in this season, is one of the uh, best. No, we got we, no, we got enough. We got a lot of her. Yeah, it's not that she wasn't used; yeah. it's that the use was terrible. The use was awful. I remember, like in the first episode, it's like, "Oh, you're pretty normal," and then episode two, that little conversation she had already, it's like, "Ooh," but then fucking C three PO emerging from the fucking ether to get her off the hook for going on this unsanctioned mission that got multiple people killed. It's just like, oh man. Yeah, not <laughs> underused. Not underused. Yeah. That's not the problem. In fact, uh, it, that might have been the problem because if she was really good and had the same amount of screen time, I might have been saying like, where the hell was she? Should have been in more of this, you know, that sort of thing. That's not the problem that we had. Contemporary Star Wars characters. I even quickly grew to love Ezra Bridger after catching up on Rebels and meeting him in live action in this new series. Um, he was I mean, chill. He was okay. He was fine. Yeah, he was okay. There's there's still problems with the way that he acted, but you know. Yeah. I hope she's. No, is she serious. gonna compliment Sabine? And there were even a couple no. of episodes of Ahsoka Ooh. that really tugged at my Star Wars loving heart. The okay, but uh, if yeah, the point of this oh, video right. is gonna be what I think it is, then you should be recognizing that that's all that episode was. Just, it's just that's designed to just go. Ah, ah, ah. First two episodes really felt like Star Wars. No, I don't even. No, know. they didn't. Nah, this nope. was dumb, and all the rebel or all the alliance people were fucking dumb. You're and that's the thing, if it's dragged. dumb all the time, then it just doesn't feel like Star Wars. Well, it feels like mm -hmm. shit Clown Wars, as Jeremy puts it. Like, it's like this, yeah. it's just this bullshit other world where it's a parody of Star Wars. It's like Spaceballs, you're or, just like, this is Yeah, dumb it's as a fuck. galaxy where everyone is stupid. Yeah, like, I just, as, as Fring pointed out, right, like, I'm not, I'm never gonna imagine, you know, like, the stupid witches and whatever, like, yeah, them cannot, talking in the same room Sorry. as uh, Luthan. That's never, I, I don't conceive nope. of that being a thing. That's not no gonna way. happen. And it also would be like, to well, which... it can't happen timeline-wise. I'm like, no, no, just the fact no, that those I mean, exist I mean, in the same in universe. universe. Yeah. In the same way that I don't believe that Han Solo dropped Cthulhu into a black hole. I don't no. believe that happened. That was Lucas's believe... vision, though. I, I don't believe <laughs> when thinking. we... Like, it, there's so much that you can do that can essentially just make me go, no, nope, that didn't happen. No matter how much you say it happened, I'm never going to treat it like it did. Um, and it's funny, the sequel trilogy is getting there now for me, where it's just like, yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they, they won, they saved the day, and everything was fine, and, and Luke didn't turn into a hermit who drinks green milk. Yeah. Straight Not that there's the anything tip. wrong with drinking green milk specifically, but, you know. Necessarily. <laughs> Kids, if you go home and your milk is green, <laughs> please yeah, don't probably drink don't, it. Probably unless don't drink it's some that. kind of Nickelodeon unless special it's, you milk. You might need a knife and fork to eat it at well, that point, it, but unless please it's colored, don't. Eat. You know, because you know, milk can have different. Uh, you can color it, sure. Yeah, you can get green milk. Just that's make right. Sure that like for St. Patrick's not... Day, you could put some green dye in your yeah. milk. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, is that something that people get do? Some, probably yeah, get some leprechaun milk. Yeah. Leprechaun. The milking of the leprechaun what? is That's a, a do we cherished presume, tradition. Why do, we, why do we presume that the leprechaun's milk would be Our green? mammals? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I assume leprechauns mammals. are mammals. Therefore, what I'm they saying is, why wouldn't we presume milk that milk for their milk young. is green? Yeah, but green? Why would it be yeah, green? Because they're leprechauns. Okay. I this mean, is very intuitive. You know. I mean, is to be fair, I don't think it? this is some of the startup by a uh, old gay Pinto, or whatever. So you may not have seen mm. it in Australia yet because he's very much America focused. Uh, yeah. Does he have? Does he have a painting of a leprechaun with yeah, green it's... milk shooting at him? Man, what he gets up to, like I said, very controversial in the '90s when he introduced leprechaun milk. That was a whole thing. Mm. Uh, yeah, but you know, I think mm. it's big, most people have come to accept that now. Gay Pinto Walsh, of course. Okay, right. Yep which never stops being a great feeling. And yeah, of course the Anakin episode got me in my feelings. It's the music. Why? It's always the damn music. So, well, but uh, that yeah. might literally just be the music. You well, hear then if the you're acknowledging you that, have, uh, shouldn't yeah. you be listing it as part of the problem? Maybe she will? I don't know. It just sounds like that's, you complimented the episode just a second ago for yeah. getting at your heart. Ugh. Also, I didn't find the music that interesting throughout the whole season, if I'm being honest. It's, it's just, pretty just fine. I, I, it's really hard for me not to see a cartoonishly, like, huge Dave Filoni in the background holding these two with his hands. And being like, uh, yeah. ooh, pew, pew, ooh, yeah, ooh, wow, boo pew, yeah. yeah. It might be just a Pavlovian response to hearing the music.
<laughs> oh, you heard the Star Wars music. Oh, it's a Star yeah. Wars. It's a Star Wars. And then my eyes did a sad. But getting me in my feelings is easy, as I'm secretly oh, a really? sap, a secret that will remain between us. Well, I mean, us. the fact that, okay, but I, I mean, the fact it. that she said that seems to speak to a recognition that this isn't that, like, it was a bit mixed. they didn't accomplish much by doing that, you know? It because remember cry, she said, but I am a big, you know, sap. Her huge compliment to Dave was referencing this episode in terms of his abilities, and now mm. she's saying, well, to be fair, it's pretty easy to get to my heart with something like this when you're using this music, and to be fair, I'm like a huge sap. It's just like, wait, so did he do well or not with this one? Yeah, maybe she'll clarify. Maybe. Let's see. And television series have a job to tell a complete story regardless of whether or not they're meant uh, to lead. Oh, do we no, want to go controversial that, with this? <laughs> controversial is no, they don't, actually. Um, complete story. That's complicated. So, like, if... Imagine someone said, I fucking hate Empire Strikes Back because it doesn't tell a complete story. Mm-hmm. What, what exactly does it mean to tell a complete story that's part of a bigger story? It's kind of... It's not... There's no clear-cut rules on that. As we know, we're all incredibly excited for Rings of Power Season 2 because Season 1 is not complete. There are still threads that's to right. solve. Uh, There's so many things I need to know. I so need many to questions know. unanswered. It's so, just, um, and, if, and if we're saying it for a season, why don't we narrow it down even more? Why not an episode? Why why shouldn't that be the idea? Because people used to make those arguments. You well, know, any, uh, any episode of TV could be someone's first episode, so you need to write it with that understanding. But we're in a place where, I think if you told that to a lot of people now, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, you might no, describe the ending of Arcane as incomplete. <laughs> season one, but maybe. At the same time, it's complete in its incompleteness. Yes. I would say <laughs> Well, there are several threads that have started and stopped, and new ones will start for season two, and new new ones will be finished from that start in season one. You know, you've got loads of them running at the same time, but a major part of season one is all, like, Vi and Jinx's relationship across the whole, all the events, right? And there's a... That motion, that, that event at the end is significant of, like, a particular route that the relationship has taken. So I understand, one could argue it is complete, and I'd be like, no, yeah, I understand that. It's just that I don't want to put the weight on Ahsoka season one, that its problem is that it's incomplete. I'd be like, well, no, right, it, this, the there's, like, not even a story. They had, they had a good five, six hours there to tell their story, which, you know, by comparison, I mean, we just watched Fall of the House of Usher. That was eight hours. That was eight episodes. It was fucking like dense. The, there's there was a lot of episodes. stuff going on in there. At the end of episode one, we've already got like maybe five or six episodes of Ahsoka in terms yeah. of the amount of content that's been delivered. Maybe more. Maybe I was about to say, I think there's more in one episode of Usher yeah. than there is in the whole season for Ahsoka. Yeah, in the whole season, that might well be the case. Um, and then, of course, you can point to other, like, you know, Andor was, uh, well, Andor was pretty long by comparison, 12 episodes. It's like, yeah, but Andor had essentially created a completed arc in three episodes, but it was still, you know, complete in its incompleteness because the story was still going. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, I, yeah. And of course, Andor's not complete either, no. right? But does she think that's a problem with Andor? That the story maybe she does. Clear? Oh, maybe, but, you know. Mm. Into we shall else. see. Fuck this bait shit, man. Look at the statues, the references, oh, the, the, the board is... <laughs> Ahsoka doesn't just not tell a complete story, but the fraction of the story it does tell just hangs in the air like the big bad thing they were all trying to stop all season long, Thrawn returning to the main galaxy, doesn't matter at all. Well, no, that's... wait, no. Um, um, I don't understand what she's saying. It I wouldn't quite put it that out. way. Like, it's... It... My criticism of the show is that, like, wow, Sabine. Good job. This is on you. And yeah, this you is facilitated massive. this all. You, you were the one who made it happen, and the show does not recognize yep. that you did this. It was this. the critical point at which everything could have been put to an end, and she didn't do it, and that is hugely consequential, because Thrawn coming back and creating a zombie like Stormtrooper army is probably going to be hugely consequential. So no, I would say that the idea that it's like devoid of is that what she's actually saying? Like that it was devoid. I mean, of was, like, uh, if I'm being generous, it sounds like she's saying that this event was treated as the big bad horrible thing that we want to avoid, and it happens, and then the characters are kind of chill about it. Which is uh, if yeah, true I, not, I, I thought that I, I thought true. that was yeah. what she's saying because well, but, okay. they should all be acting like the Avengers at the end of Infinity War, shouldn't they? <laughs> like oh, yeah, shit. like like this is a tragedy sort of thing. 
But the yeah. not only are but they not like, like that, um, Ahsoka's like, we're exactly where we need to be, smile. Uh, whatever. Um, but I don't know, she phrased it in a way that threw me off as well. Mm. In long, Thrawn returning to the main galaxy doesn't matter at all. Like, I would argue the show thinks it absolutely matters that they're showing us that yeah. we're going to have some dire consequences as a result. The characters are out of character in this moment, though. They're weird, but they're, mm. they're kind of weird throughout the show. The big criticism, like, everyone had this since episode one, was like, why is it that all three of our main characters are all so fucking wooden? What's going on? Especially when we know that they're played by actresses that are capable of a hell of a lot more. At least two of them are. Yeah. I think yeah, two or three of them are, yeah. By the end of the season, not a single one of our main characters addresses the fact that the oh, very okay, thing okay. everyone was trying to stop happened happened. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I, I agree. Good. Um, mm. There you go. Mm. Okay. We get. Interesting. I don't want to bat for the show at all, but I'm just saying we do get uh, Sabine saying sorry for having caused this to happen with Thrawn, and then Ahsoka says, "I know." And that that's was it. before that, wasn't it? It will, yeah, but the the yeah. recognition of the consequence of Thrawn may very well escape now because he's got the potential to. Like that's still, yeah, but like, yes, but I don't believe Sabine. Sorry. Well, I, I was I was gonna move into saying that I thought that scene was fucking terrible. Like the, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's w what an absolute crazy waste of conflict to just have all the characters be like, oh well, no, it's no. okay. No, uh, well, you win some, you lose some. You live, you learn. Life goes on. Yeah. Unless it doesn't, yeah, because Thrawn, Thrawn's back and he's going to destroy us all. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. So is it stop, Mola? You don't buy that. What do you mean? The thing that happened? Like, the, that's... <laughs> he said the scene was shit! <laughs> it's the, but it, ha it did happen. I'm not going to take that happen. away from the show. They had her say sorry, and Ahsoka said that's alright, or whatever. Like, that that did happen. It, if they had she never acknowledged it, I would have said it was right much worse, but... I, I, I was more shocked that, like, it actually managed to get through. I was half expecting none of the characters to say anything to Sabine. Well, the fact that we went for, a, like, a couple episodes there with nobody talking about it. Yeah. Get, but then remember, their conversation was cut short by an ambush. Oh, no, wait, their conversation ended and then the ambush happened. Because that's the Dave Filoni signature. <laughs> you know, can't, can't be slow for too long. We need to get a fight in there. It's that you're bringing it up even though it's nothing that defends the show. It does defend the show slightly. It's, it uh, defends it a little bit. It's, it's, and it's important to be fair to, to point out that it was recognized, it's just really shittily. Which is still better than not recognizing it at all, which is exactly what Ezra did. I don't believe we had any line from Ezra about Thrawn, did we? Like, no. an, and Sabine's responsibility on that. Someone else I saw someone point out that was interesting in the comments for uh, one of our coverages of it. It was like, did they uh. seriously take a huge break? in order to have Ezra build a lightsaber when, like, mm -hmm. everything was hyper-urgent. It's like, yes, yeah, so they didn't even just have Hu Yang give him one. You know, make him one quick. He's a robot. Well, and also, they were just, like, going walking pace. Just, like, floating around. Yep. Yeah, and, 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 and if anyone wanted to say, like, a Jedi has to build their own lightsaber, it's like, oh, we're, we're urgent, urgent right now. Urgent. The things are happening. But you're not Jedi because the order is... That's another thing people say as well, so it just gets to the point where you're like... <laughs> It's so fucking complicated. It is completely at peace, seemingly indifferent to the threat that the galaxy faces, despite the entire- So I think what Filoni would tell you is that, no, 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 she knows what- she's got a job to do, but she is like, she's zen now. She, she, she doesn't- she doesn't stress out, she doesn't panic. She knows what's to be done, and she will do it. She's like Yoda. Even though Yoda showed a lot more <laughs> anxiety in his later years than uh, Ahsoka has at all, at least in this. The entire motivation of her character has been to stop Thrawn since her introduction into the live-action stories. Then Hera and oh, Ezra she did a bad meet job. up and neither exchanges a word about what his return means. The, the, like, a lot of the characters barely talk at all, that's the thing. Yeah. It um, sucks. Like, I, when I watch The Lord of the Rings, I, I get this very clear um, sense that Frodo and Sam went to destroy the ring and Mount Doom and all that stuff, and all the scenes... You're like, oh, they're doing this because they're on their way to Mount Doom, where they have to do this so that they can get to Mount Doom. It's all like in service to that actual goal. Um, and there's a sense of like passion and determination that goes along with that. But in this show, if you were to say, oh, yeah, the scene where they're just sort of like walking around or standing around or just sort of w just just meandering in this field. Yeah, they're, they're trying to stop Thrawn from destroying the galaxy or whatever. I'd be like, I don't believe you. How, they, they don't get, no, they're like taking a break or walking or something. 
Well, yeah, because there's no sense of urgency at all. There's like 17 issues with the way Ezra arrives here, but another thing that sucks is like his expression should just not be happy. I'm sorry, there's way too much negative, even though he gets to reunite with Hera. I understand that that's a positive, but like, can you imagine the amount of bad news he's about to tell them? Well, uh, why did it isn't it interesting? He didn't try to like kill Thrawn, right? He just let him sort of escape. Presumably he got onto a ship and left as soon as he could. We didn't see any of that, so yeah. And decided that he wasn't worth taking a taking a shot at uh Thrawn. He uh he had a lightsaber with him, right? Yeah, I think mm. so. Interesting that he was uh more willing to do it as a kid, I guess. Um I don't know. I don't know what to think about that. That's uh I I guess I would need to watch more of Rebels before I could make any more criticism of that. Well uh, just tactical retreat or something. <laughs> Yeah. The excitement these characters show to be reunited is important, of course, but excitement they show. not at the cost of yeah. engaging with your story's own stakes. True. It would have been Sorry. as easy as following up their tear brim smiles with the dawning realization of what seeing each yeah. other truly meant, or yeah. even. I don't oh even think. God. Yeah, even the happy wow. feels wholesomeness was kind of crap. They didn't. Yeah. It, yeah. Felt, it felt like artificial. I will hug you, and I will hug you as well. I will this now is giggle. A symbol he, he, of my he, he, affection he, he. for you. Yeah. Initiating giggle procedures. <laughs> Procedure Ezra pointing, Ezra pointing it out to Hera, who may not have realized that his return included the return of Thrawn. And you could even have her recognizing that. She'd be like, wait, if you're here. And then he's like, Thrawn. you know, and he's yeah. just looking at her, and she's looking at him like they're both stern, because they both know what it means, instead of like, hee <laughs> hello, oh, yay, yeah. hello. Yeah. Sabine, however, has made it abundantly clear that she's willing to sacrifice a whole galaxy if it means getting Ezra back home, yep. so at least one person's reaction makes sense here. That's it. Um, we just her still doesn't make sense. Yeah, I don't know if I'd say it makes sense. She she doesn't, I don't think that she... Having I mean, her be the character that says like, her. but oh no, things aren't as great well, as they could I be. Think, you know, you point to, remember how she reacted when she saw that Ahsoka was alive and it... Remember oh how my she god. When Ezra was basically asking, like, what's happened, you know, where is Ahsoka? And she's, she's just, it's just like, oh, it's complicated. And she just nods and says, yeah. I, it's like, dude, you think she's dead? The only <laughs> thing you can assume with that is that the actress genuinely wasn't, like, given the correct direction. Because why would you Maybe. portray her yeah. like that when she believes that she's not only lost, like, her mentor, but one of her best friends, one of the most important people in the world, who's trying to say, you know what I mean? It's just like, how. <laughs> How could you possibly buy that that's what's being expressed there as opposed yeah. to the actress being like, yeah, she's fine. She'll be back. Because yeah. I was profoundly uh, unimpressed by Sabine's actress, but even she would be able to distinguish between like normalness and sadness. This is, this is what I mean about... Betrayed. That's why I said direction, yeah, because like, it's... No, no way this actress is unable to look sad. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure most people can pull it off, even Gal Gadot. If you uh, just uh, you like look down and and be like, just don't say a thing. There you go. You've nailed it. Just end there. Why? Well, because we're either setting up Dave Filoni's movie or Ahsoka season two. I love how that's just everyone's uh, assumption at this point. Like that's that's how bad it's gotten. Disney. Nobody believes like that you're doing this for any other reason than try to sell something else. Which you know, Ahsoka season two is that a likely prospect? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, and remember, didn't Bob Iger say that they're gonna uh, they're gonna be cutting well, back on some of these productions? As imagine well, so. all of the catastrophic results of the recent stuff with Marvel, and you walk from Marvel as like a big old up top person for Disney, walk into the studios for like the live action stuff, and you're like, "Good God, this is a fucking circus on fire!" Everybody's running around screaming, and this just nobody likes what we're doing, and. <laughs> Good go. Okay, I'm. I, I, there's I, some passion. You, uh, yeah, you guys do you. I'll, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go check out Star Wars. It's like, oh, how's Mandalorian season three? Yeah, how are we doing? It's like, uh, numbers aren't great. It's like, okay, Ahsoka, numbers aren't great. It's like the numbers are uh, worse actually for that one. Um, yeah, it's not great. It's, and it's like, how much money do we spend on this? Oh, well over a hundred million dollars. Um, maybe closer to two hundred million dollars. Just wait. Each? Oh. And uh, we'll get Ahsoka teaming up with Simba, teaming up with Iron Man to reignite all of the franchises. What do you think they can actually... Because now we've got the, the projections for the Marvels ain't great. Um, they're pretty low. Panicking. They are panicking, for sure. Yeah, Especially with the actors and writers' strikes. Holy shit. Yeah. The absolute Which, um... chunks getting taken out of uh, Hollywood right now is crazy. 
Well, I have I'm a feeling not, that um, in like 50 years from now, this era will be looked back on as like where Hollywood had to make enormous, like significant changes. Something has to change because you can't be spending over $200 million on a movie with your long term domestic projections at like 120 to $150 million. Yeah. Like that's, or, like, that's crazy. Or I think it might have been a little, what was it? I think the projection, I think the top end was like $180 million domestic for the Marvels. Which I think is lower than Ant Man got. I think there's Dude, uh... the key is they they need to find someone who can write stories that are well, exciting, yeah, like with fighting, good fighting sequences, but have oh. good characters. Because yeah. good characters alone ain't selling it to Star Wars fans because they've just been yeah. they're just they're they've been conditioned. They need I guess, the, at this point. the spectacle, which I understand and I'm okay with. Yeah, I, you, like yeah, having a spectacle. Something I, something I struggle with is um. I don't know that these, I've said this so many times, but I just, I, I'm becoming more and more certain of it. It's like, I don't think they can accurately diagnose the problems that they have. There was that recent news now where Marvel's basically admitted, yeah, we have problems on our TV side. And <laughs> everybody's like, oh yeah, no, true, true, true. But then I listen to that, it's like, oh, on the TV side, yeah? On the TV side, with the implication that the movie side is, is doing okay, you know? Doing just fine. And the last like, hit was Guardians 3? Well, so Guardians mm, 3... Yes. Because, yeah, Secret Invasion did not... I, I think Loki's viewership is okay. Like, that that one has done better. Mm -hmm. But it'll okay. be interesting to see what its long term is. But Guardians 3 was successful. But Guardians 3's opening was under. And I think it's still kind of like... It was a success, but it's like a... Oh, uh, you know? Well, like it has it was, to be recognized. Maybe, maybe it have done better than that, you know? It has to be recognized by the higher-ups. Guardians 3 was not made the same way that those others are getting made. No, James exactly. Gunn would have been given a lot of power. And also, it, it, shows. You know, it has more of a meta sense that people know that this is kind of different than the other Marvel films. Whereas I think the Marvels will sort of be, again, more of an accurate test of, like, what exactly yeah. is people's interest in a generic Marvel movie? Well, from what like we can... Really Marvel movie. What we can gather from the eras, the Marvels has been created in the same way Quantumania was, in the same way MOM was, in the same way a lot of them have been. The division between Phase 4 and 5 just doesn't mean anything. No. You're making things the same way. It's, um, it'll be still a few films from now before they're going to try a different formula. Because they're trying a different formula soon oh. with TV shows, right? It wow. may bleed into films so, at some point. So here's the thing, though. Apparently, Disney still wants to keep their release dates for, like, Deadpool 3, which is meant to come out in May, and they haven't finished shooting it yet. You know what I mean? It's like, damn, man. Like, really? Yeah. You gotta, like, try to get that one out on time? Like really, you gotta you gotta keep that date, and I think and it, and it's because you know the aspects of the business that people don't think about as much, which is they got shareholders to appease, and when you push your movies out of you know it's like that's money that you're not well, making yeah, this year. That's the thing we read recently about um, Lords of the Fallen, like got fucking crippled by the fact that they had to you know appease certain contracts slash stockholders, and then also. Wire move it to a, a superior engine, quote-unquote, and, like, it's it's given the game all of these launch problems that the fucking dev team are, like, scrambling over. Well, and, you know, it's, um, cyberpunk... It's something... It's a it's an often not-known thing. I'm pretty sure that in 2020... Because Cyberpunk 2077, that came out in 2020, right? I'm pretty sure at some point in 2020... Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think CD Projekt was actually, like, the the largest company in Poland based on its market cap. I think that's the case when that game was coming out. And it's like, yeah, those kinds of pressures are going to influence, you know, whether or not the games get delayed or not. Because when you delay the game, you know, the stock price goes down, right? People get people get a little bit antsy. And it's like, yeah, these are the kinds of things that can uh, influence the decision making. Yeah, and they're know, not going it's, away. It's these things will be there forever. Uh... No, these sorts of pressures will always be there. These are two things that should be wildly exciting, but now could end up in Star Wars Purgatory with the rest of the franchise's many abandoned projects for all I care. Seasons of television are not commercials. They are f mm, Star Wars ones are. Oh, Disney ones are. <laughs> like, this is, it's funny because uh, she's kind of put it... Commercials. It's so sad, though. Do you remember, didn't James Gunn tweet about, like, we're in a sad state of affairs if people are more excited for the fucking after credits scene than the episode or the film? Like, what the hell? How do we get here? What's yeah. going on? I think this is going to be, like, I'm pretty confident this will be looked back as most embarrassing 
a, a stage of media in our in human history one of the most embarrassing yeah i, I would buy one of them because it's uh it's hard to see it when you're in the middle of it but like good god the list of examples at this point is absolutely nuts and to to have converted a money printer into like a disney plus screensaver is um so, something just something to behold but good job guys foundations for what's to come but ahsoka season one can't stand on its own because there's no foundation built it's just a string of happenings until ahsoka and sabine are stranded and throngs back in galaxy prime she's uh she's spitting okay this is just true yeah she's <laughs> this is all <laughs> wow ign yeah i know um, ign say how, this how did, how did this chick get hired <laughs> she slipped through the cracks and if none of our primary characters give a about that then why should we as viewers? I like how none of those stormtroopers can see in the back or uh, yeah. Ahsoka in the back. I like That's how insane. The like stormtroopers, two dozen stormtroopers, like twenty feet behind them, and none of them were able to hit Ahsoka in the back or it just hit Ahsoka at all. That's fucking nuts. I like how the when they were turned into shambling, brainless fucking zombies, literally like magical zombies, that they were far more effective. <laughs> like they actually made the heroes run away. It's just funny. Part of that legacy is one of death. Uh oh. War. But you're more than that. Nostalgia is great. I love nostalgia, but it's meant to be a enough. single tool. In oh, just as she just said, it's a tool. Use it properly. Use it respectfully, please. On your arsenal, rather than your only instrument. Skywalkers have been so aggressively shoehorned into so many stories that they don't need Frick. to be in that it's getting Frick. to the point that I don't even want to hear the name anymore. Oh Frick. my god, yes. Yes, this is got it. Wow, yes, true. Yeah. I can't believe they gave us stupid world between worlds Anakin. Next episode, stupid, well, like, hologram or references to Anakin. And then we had Force Ghost Anakin, too. It's like, you gave us three different yeah. fucking Anakins? Stop! <laughs> Why isn't he showing up to Luke? Why isn't Luke invested in getting the robot that has all of the information about the Jedi and their construction and their fall? Why would Luke be talking to Hu Yang constantly? <laughs> He'd be like, please print out everything you know into books now. That's an incredible conversation that if written well, I would be super interested in. Well, the Empire's basically fallen now. I gotta restart the Jedi Order or feel that's right. I have to learn from the mistakes of the past. I'm gonna have this talk with Hu Yang. What happened? Do you th Does the robot have any personal feelings about it? It, it, what what would that conversation look like? Yeah. The master was General Anakin Skywalker. Listen to me, I am six yes. blues. The galaxy is vast. There are so many. No, <laughs> not this oh my one. God. Is she, no, is she this is a tiny the, galaxy. The point that in a massive galaxy, there's many, many, many stories you could tell about many different people who aren't Skywalkers. Can you though? Can you? Oh. Is that possible? Sounds like oh it isn't. Goodness. I'm particularly cynical about this after Andor, of course. Like, we stretch yeah. out and then it's just, it fades and you're like, no! Yeah. <laughs> no! Rich stories worth exploring and all Star Wars seems capable of doing is returning to the same well over and over again. Yep. True. One is never too old to learn, Snips. I enjoy Luke. I adore Leia. Their stories are over, but not as over. Okay, wait. <laughs> like, Why are you showing those images? No, no, it's not even just that. I guess that. she didn't probably do the video editing. I don't like. I always hated this attitude. I've talked about it so many times. But when people are like, "Why are they even in the sequel trilogy? Their stories are told." It's like, "Fuck off!" What do you mean? They need. It's. It's. If the sequel trilogy takes place in any span of time where they are still alive, they need to. They're be major in players it. in this Very universe. Major. Of course, they. If they're not. <laughs> if they're not physically present as like actors and characters in the show, they have to be referenced, and they need. To, I don't want to be too like have to need to, but they probably should be referenced, and there needs to be a lot of allusions to them existing and what they did. It's frustrating because it's, there's so many assumptions are being run at the same time. First, that like they've had a story, therefore they've had their story, as if we can't have more stories for a single character. And then secondly, just because you don't have an arc to give a character does not mean they cannot be in a story. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, static insane. characters are okay. And, uh, yeah, like, she's she's almost there, right? She's like, uh, stop digging them up and throwing them on. Like, I'm tired of seeing them. 
But, but when you move that into their stories were told, you didn't need to do anything else. Like, I don't think that applies necessarily to fucking Luke Skywalker, who's about to build a whole new world after destroying the. It was like this obvious. I mean, remember a story before there. Disney took over, there were whole games and books yeah. written about the people loved. Luke and what he did and what he was doing, and people did love them. Whereas Disney their fathers, was like, fuck that shit, is meant to be. Ahsoka Tano is much more than her master. Why then are most of the only parts of the series worth engaging with when Anakin is around? It's not even worth engaging with. <laughs> I don't even think it's worth. That's not the worst that it is. But. It's not that he shouldn't have been in the series at all. There's justification there, just as there was for young Luke and Leia to be involved in Obi Wan Kenobi. But no. Uh, like, I'm trying to be nice. Like, y you can write it so that there is, but like, wouldn't it have been far more interesting to have Obi Wan Kenobi going on his adventure that doesn't regard everything? Doesn't literally fucking repeat a lot of the beats of Revenge of the Sith? Like, what are you doing? Because that has the same problem, right? But I guess that's what she's saying. That show would have had the same problem, not th even though there is justification to have Leia and Luke show up in it. Like, yeah, I suppose, but we don't, like, I just. Oh, how they handled that. That's some PTSD flashbacks as well. Ahsoka is meant to be Dave Filoni's pride and joy. How is she out here playing second fiddle to a corpse? Listen, I'm teaching you how to lead. How to survive. Wait. Oh, because she means, I guess, because she's, but he's not dead here. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's weird to call him a corpse. Unless she's saying Hayden, Hayden Christensen's a bad actor in general, maybe. I don't think that's I what think, she's saying. I, I think she's yeah. saying that Darth Vader's dead. He's like, dead, Anakin yeah. Skywalker's dead. Um, I get that, but at the same time, he is very much alive in these sequences. Like, like we're dealing with a living... Yeah, this is even a flashback. This is supposed to have happened, like, as this is happening. So, there's, like, a fair competition there. But, uh, uh, I would rather compare her performance to Hu Yang. I think that would be way better. Like, how is it possible that just those eye changes and the subtle bits that David Tennant is putting into the performance, despite the fact that he's been told to play a robot is doing so much more for expression than Rosario Dawson. How is that happening? And to do that, you're going to have to fight. I don't know what happened here, or how Ahsoka never ended up being a show about Ahsoka, but it's a tremendous bummer and a rare miss from the creator. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a common, it seems to be a common L. <laughs> yeah. he's, uh, he's had control over at least somewhat of... Didn't he have Mandalorian episodes went to Dave Filoni? Yeah. Ones? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep, he definitely he's executive producer. All of his also. toys, he gets to play with all of his toys all the time in their shit. Because of him, though, his toys could be awesome if someone who didn't treat them as toys had control over it. A miss that could have been avoided if the title character was allowed to stand on her own two feet with a single shred of her personality. Stand on her own two feet wouldn't be what I would say as an issue. It's it's the second part. The uh shred of a personality that's the problem for me <laughs> and the implication and there is a shred of one mm -hmm. before anyone goes blaming rosario dawson we've seen her show emotion and be engaging on the mandalorian so maybe we should uh, be more no, critical no, we haven't well I, I thought she was just going to go the direction of we know rosario dawson can act you know, can have, um which is true i wonder if we should make room for more criticism though even with that being said if an actor can act and chooses not to or doesn't assist a project in a sense of being like, eh, I'm just going to phone it in, the director doesn't care and I don't care. Should that still then have some weight on them as an actor in terms of like, well, that's not great. The opposite of this, I would say, is Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's not a project that he won't go fucking ham in, basically. Yeah, Nicholas Cage, yeah. something like that. People who he just are like, I don't care what this thing is, I'm, I'm putting my shit in here, I'm doing it. And it's like, yeah, that's great. That's, that's an aspect of acting that is awesome, you know? Um, and should Rosario Dawson get some criticism for not having done much at all? I, but think, I think so. I, yeah. I think, yeah, like th there should be something there, even with the caveat that we know she's, uh, it's not a commentary on her potential, it's a commentary on what no. she chose to do. Especially since, you know, there's a lot of other people in the show who are also giving comparable performances, you know? Someone just said, yeah, Charles Dance, even though he had, like, fucking five lines in Godzilla, they are all great, like, delivered. <laughs> yeah, he's still real good in Godzilla. This is not a performance issue. Kanan took the one. It still is a performance issue, though. Yeah, I'd say so. The other I held on to in case he ever needed it. It is proper that you should have it. Just to clear something up right out of the gate, I love fan service. 
I love a little nerdy moment. They're great, they're fun. And once again, they are tools. The Honorable Senator Organa has become aware Ugh. of an unfortunate. Uh, pause just in I case. can't believe that, that they brought, brought him C3PO. To bail Again. out Hera and in the and the crossfire deal damage to Leia and uh and Mon Mothma as well. Well, and the Republic. Let's be honest. And the Republic. This is a, an insane yeah, event that took place. There should be records really that definitively understand. prove this easily. That this is all insane perjury nonsense. I just I don't understand why like the Dave Filoni John Favreau shows have like consistently characterized the New Republic as either incompetent or antagonistic when they replace the Empire. I don't get it. Yeah, it really it really undermines the payoff of Return of the Jedi. You put well, these just, guys in charge? Yeah. Ugh. I mean, at least the Empire kept the trains running on time. <laughs> just picture, like... It's just so funny to see the corruption reflected so hard. It's just like, guys, this is not good. You're not supposed to show this happening. How is this any different than fucking Palpatine getting all of his preferential treatment? Fucking, I mean... Uh, yeah. It's one of those like, well, if the events of the original trilogy never happened and the state of the universe was just as it was after the Clone Wars, then, I mean, arguably, the galaxy might be in a better off spot. The First Order started off by blowing up five planets. That's yeah, which was nuts. retarded. Um, and that's the thing. The, the Empire was insane in the end by, like, you know, blowing up places like Alderaan and stuff. But I was going to say the... Um, the irony, I guess, is that the idea we often talked about for a potential sequel trilogy was Leia becoming hawkish, right? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And you could write something like this, where Leia's got a team of, that she prefers, led by Hera, and they do something that the viewers are like, I don't know, mm. I don't know about that mission, and Leia clears it instantly. She's like, yep, they're good, they're fine, they're my guys. And you have a character who's like, you can't do that. And she's like, uh, yeah, I can. I can. I'm a general. Yeah, I save the galaxy. And you, like, you can already picture the scene. There's no soundtrack. Had, it's all very like yeah. dry and a bit worrying. Yeah. And it's like set up. It's foreshadowing for where Leia's going right now. The problem. But this yeah. show, look how fucking like sitcom level lighting we have, and and just how chill everything is and wholesome. And we start giggling about how we've taken over the government for ourselves. We can just do whatever we want. It's like, whoa, that's weird. That's not quite right situation they are never that was another thing that just struck me about the show i hate how flatly shot everything is yeah uh, yeah yeah zach it's, snyder it's, can it's... have interesting shots yep so uh, there i mean that's uh, something it gives my eyes some kind of you know something under any circumstance like look at that shot that wasn't you know that wasn't very interesting. the anakin one yeah yeah bang mm. star wars lately Nearly nothing but fan service. Not you. Wait, and hold or, on. Or, I, oh, not you, okay, Andor. Good. Ooh, wait, a good hunk wait, of the Mandalorian. Wait. You're doing great, sweeties. No, wait, no hold Mandalorian. On. What? You can't cite Mandalorian season two is doing great. That was one of the ones that did it loads. Yeah. <laughs> no, I want to make no, sure. No, no. Hang on. Maybe she said something else. Hang on. Andor or a good hunk of the Mandalorian. You're doing great, sweeties. Oh, she said a no, good hunk of it. Which is weird no. when she's showing a visual of season two because season one, I would argue, is the the that least fan service Luke, of the three. Luke is standing off frame. Yeah, you know? so he's weird. Like, <laughs> Maybe that's why she said a good hunk of it because yeah. like specifically, Maybe. like the Pedro Pascal Baby Yoda stuff isn't fan service, but the Luke stuff is. So. Yeah, maybe. But that was that was probably one of the biggest fan service moments. It was designed to apologize for TLJ that scene. Look, Luke's That's killing loads of robots. Look at him go. He's, He's not strong. a loser. Ladies, even shows I enjoy like Obi Wan Kenobi, bless oh, it, damn. it's pointless. Why? I fucking... don't understand. I don't understand you. I I hate that choreography <laughs> in this fight. It sucks yeah, so much ass. Yeah, it's really bad. Obi Wan and Darth Vader right after it's just like why are you showing me this? Stop it! <laughs> it's, it's, it's so awkward. Bless it, it's pointless. But I had a good time. Are wrapped up in this never ending cycle of, well, it's what the fans want. I don't want it. I don't <laughs> want that shit. <laughs> the job of a creative isn't to give viewers exactly what they want. The job of a creative is to give them what they never thought they could have wanted. I feel like it's a balance between the two of them, actually. Uh, yeah. A lot of the time. There's no I mean, harm in being like, I'd really love to see an emotional scene from this actor doing well, and then you get that. I was like, yeah. 
This, this, These are the kind of like weighty like statements that they have to inject. It's not what they wanted. It's what they could have wanted. It's like what, what... they needed. No, 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 no. It's 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 like pro. It's just things contradict. Things are crap. Thing dialogue <laughs> doesn't. It's boring. It's pointless. It's it. it like why why does it have to be this like thesis all, every single time? Yeah, uh, uh, well, because like, uh, like some sort of philosophical some philosopher's quote or something. I feel like there's something to the idea that uh, sometimes you don't give the fans what they're asking for, as opposed to you show them something and they're surprised to see this is actually what they want. You know, there, there's there's something to dig out of it in terms of um, maybe like the sequel to Alien being Aliens was considered maybe not a good move by a lot of people in some ways because it's not like Alien at all, but then it turns out to be like really... In the same way, T2, it's like you can't make the bad guy from the first one the good guy. Like, is that... Would the fans even want to see something like that? And then it's like, no, they fucking loved it. You know, there's, there's decisions that can come across as controversial, I think. And then it's like, no, it turns out the fans actually really would like it. Fans can be like... Um, you know, like Heath Ledger's casting for Joker, right? It was just like, ah, fuck that, what are you doing? Get us, get us, uh, you know, someone we'd expect to fit the role, which I believe Jared Leto, by a lot of people, was seen as someone who would fit the role of Joker. And it was, you know, there's plenty of uh, ways that an artist can be like, trust me on this one, okay? Let me, just give me a chance. I'm going to try and make this work. But then at the same time, there's nothing wrong with providing the audience uh, a little bit of just what they're asking for, which for us at this point... Give us some character, please. I would outright consider it fan service if I could just see some characters. That'd be nice. Art is meant to inspire new worlds, to push boundaries, to explore corners of the galaxy we never could have dreamed of. But ever since The Last Jedi dared to go outside of truth. Don't do that narrative. Don't do that shit. Oh. Use your brain. So many just people a run this bit. narrative. The Last Jedi was experimental, different, and interesting. And since they hate that, we've now gone defensive, and we only do safe stuff. It's such a lame myth. It's not true. The Last Jedi did a lot of uh, copycatting of older Star Wars stuff. There was plenty of what you could call fan service in this. There was also a shit ton of really wonky subversion that was poorly written. That's what happened. I hate that there's like a simultaneous arguing of Luke is actually his most impressive in TLJ where he comes through and he, he gives him his own life to, you know, defend and reignite the Republic or the Rebellion, blah, blah, blah. But then you also say, like, people couldn't handle Luke being portrayed in a way that was, you know, lesser and weaker and he didn't trust his own legacy and stuff. It's like, fucking pick one, all right? One of your narratives, because, like, both of those are bullshit. But, yeah, The, the Last Jedi Seed is like this, this uh, sacred little guy who was just trying to make a difference. The artist was just trying to show you what Star Wars could become, okay? Could be that the answer to Rey's parentage was actually nothing. Could be that Snoke didn't mean shit all and just died. Could be that we could break all of the space battles forever by doing the stupid hyperspace thing. Could be we have a whole half an hour sequence about how capitalism is awful and it's just like really clunky and weird and everyone's like, why didn't you delete this? It would have made the film a lot shorter. Could be that we waste Finn completely as a character, just waste anything we built in Force Awakens that was remotely likable or interesting. What else? Could be that we could create a whole new character that was incredibly annoying and undermine Poe completely. Could be that we separate Rey, Poe, and Finn completely so that there's no building of their relationship. All of which, these are things that uh, Rise of Skywalker tried to immediately compensate for. Do you guys remember the opening of Rise of Skywalker, they have the three of them walking and like shouting and talking about all their in like we gotta get this. Oh, the ship's breaking oh, this. Oh, and the cameras spinning yep. around them as if to tell us like, oh, look at these, look at these three. Ah, oh, look at them go. <laughs> it's like shut well, up. Never spend any time with each other. You yeah. didn't do what the OT did, and now you're trying to make up for it because <laughs> you fucking had a shitty attempt at copying it. It's. Yeah, obviously I have trauma related to TLJ, and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay, it's good to get that out of your system every once in a while. Five, five years of therapy, uh, we're still going. Traditional so, we're making good progress. ...and outcry arose from the worst corners of the fandom. <laughs> fuck off. Yeah, fuck you. Don't call Yoda the worst corners of the fandom. There to have. Star Wars seems to have been utterly terrified to be new, different, or interesting. The sheer mention of It's not even- I'm trying to, like, go the direction of, like, Ahsoka could have been safe, boring, and good. Like, it could- you yep. could have executed this shit normally, 
we we I think Rags you talked about how like Herazar could have been as a general. She's got all this new power. She brings them into a mission. Two of them die, and she deals with the fact that like how can she be given the power to just at a whim have someone die on her command? Like that's something she goes through in the season. It's like what's Sabine doing? It's like she's responsible for destroying the galaxy potentially. That's obviously something you could have her deal with. What's Ahsoka dealing with? Like, well, I would probably want to watch all of Clone Wars and Rebels to come up with something I think is suitable. But if we run with what was clearly attempted, is that the, we give her insecurities about being a mentor and we make it so that she loses to Bale and we do all the shit that I was talking about in the video. Like, if you did all of that and the show could still be considered safe because they all complete their arcs and they're all still healthy and okay and that Thrawn makes it back to the house, it could still be good. It'll be entertaining. You can still bait your stupid Mortis stuff, too. Tatooine should be exciting. I don't like sand. Instead, it's so overused that it just makes me roll my eyes at this point. Meanwhile, it should be downright thrilling to hear mentions of Luke. But each time he gets shoehorned in, another hunk of that excitement gets sacrificed to the Sarlacc pit. Was Luke even mentioned in this show? I don't think he was mentioned. Oh, I don't even think so. Problem. Yeah, it was one it's of our big problem. problems. Yeah, it was dumb as fuck the... They were like, they're talking about, uh, what was his name? The one from Rebels that trained Ezra? Uh, uh Kanan. Yeah, like, he he got he this there. little section that's clearly only meant to go, do you remember Kanan? Kanan did this. Yes, he did. That's what he did. Yes. And that was that. And it's just like, why hasn't Luke been mentioned at all? <laughs> mm -hmm. The Book of Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Ahsoka, each one of these series had so much opportunity to push the boundaries of the universe in which they exist. That's the whole point of introducing television into an existing film franchise. I don't agree. I don't think you have to push boundaries. I think yeah, that I the fact yeah, that it's so have... shittily written, we're looking for reasons beyond the fact that it's shittily written. It's just like Marvel. You know yeah. what it is? You didn't push boundaries. It's like... Not necessarily. No, you just wrote a shit story with shit characters and a bad plot, and lots of things didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. By adding long-form storytelling into your sagas, you have the opportunity to explore parts of your galaxy that have never been touched or to give more meaning to an already beloved character's journey. Which wouldn't be necessarily exploring new things, you know? No. And which would also be In okay. In fact, Dave might say, that's what I'm doing here with Ahsoka. Oh, he Don't would absolutely go. make that argument, yeah. Sure. Instead, Lucasfilm has squandered most of their opportunities in hanging out on Tatooine some more. So this is the boat where I'd be like, yeah, where have you been? <laughs> like that's, that's, they've been squandering this <laughs> shit for the, since they bought it. For years. Yep. A couple of weeks ago, IGN's Clint Gage said that Star Wars just feels like unboxing videos now. It's kind of funny. <laughs> and I absolutely hate that he was right. The Force provides you with insight. But it does not give one all the answers. Fucking hell. I hate lines <laughs> like that so much. <laughs> oh, this is a profound so thing that was said. No, yes. it wasn't. The Force doesn't tell you everything. Like, like yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, I bro. know that that's never been a perspective that's been espoused. Ahsoka was announced. I was ecstatic. A whole show about our girl. She was going to find Thrawn and do whatever she could to stop him. Sure, she'd probably fail, but she'd fight. Rally the troops and fight again. She'd carve her own path outside of the shadow of her master and do everything she could to keep the galaxy- This is so funny because Dave would be like, What do you mean? She did. That's yeah, what that's happened. Yeah, she did. Yeah. You guys just hating to hate, IGN. Dave. Instead, we got a whole finale centered on stormtrooper zombies because, ooh, ah, more toys. Oh yeah, I can imagine people will be picking up the zombie stormtroopers. Zombie stormtrooper toys, yeah. Meanwhile, the last we saw of Shin Hanti and Balin Skull, two wildly interesting new characters. Uh, let's wild go. Okay, Shin we can explain wildly this. Wildly interesting. It is wildly flavorful to have like you know a banana when you've just had nothing at all for your whole life, right? It would be like an insane taste. And I assume that's what she's getting at, is we had nothing at all from anyone, 
And then we had a character, we said this on the coverage, we have Balin who tells us his interests, his values. It's like, whoa, yeah. that's, that's um, wild. But, but I guess the thing that I would add in is like, let's not put Shin in the mix. She's not interesting at all. It's Balin who's a Nothing little bit interesting. interesting about Shin. I was going to say, I don't even body. know what I would say about Shin. Really she's, says anything. she's a little confused. She's, she's kind of Kylo level right now. She doesn't know what's going on. Yep. Balin's the only interesting one outside of Hu Yang, but like the reasoning for both of them is very complicated and specific. It's not impressive. Yep. Was them just standing off in the distance, kicking their feet? Their arc sacrificed in favor of undead soldiers. I don't even know, like I don't. Just, Dave just doesn't give a shit, really. He was just like, "I'll uh, sort them out next time," or "I'll give mm -hmm. them some other vague things to say and do." It always feels like uh, passing the time. It never feels like he's got a goal. Yep. Not a moment of stakes acknowledged or reckoned with, not a single narrative arc fulfilled, and no real climax to be had. Just a six-episode stepping stone to something else. I... What a bummer. For more Star Wars, check out why episodes. recasting Balin's but, goal is okay, great. That's, so, Alright, so now I need to know, what num what did they actually score? Well, wait, 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 because I've got, I've got the image, right? So th this is funny, because this is something I already knew about, and I think a lot of people knew about it. Um... IGN are just funny. They're, they're a constant source of hilarity, but whenever they get a take, like this, by the way, which was pretty solid, we, we mostly agree with a lot of that, yep. um, you might be like, well, is IGN, like, fixing themselves up? And it's like, well, the first thought is, like, wait a minute, what did IGN even think about Ahsoka when it came what? out? <laughs> Check it out. Oh my, that's hilarious. <laughs> Gee, that was a nine after that, okay. That's oh. the finale episode, by the way. Finale it's episode. A nine. nine out of ten. A nine. <laughs> this angry Joe shit. <laughs> a, nine out of, a nine out of ten. Nine. It's such a like. I'm sorry. What the hell? What's going on? It's like you just, you just copied all the talking points from the other people. You didn't. You thought it was a nine. <laughs> now, to be fair, this different could writers. Be someone completely to this lady who uh you gotta who, sort that out you can't have like a source of a yeah, channel you having you can't, exactly. this shit you doesn't can't make any sense how bad the finale is when as far as your publication is concerned the finale was damn near flawless star wars yeah, ahsoka comes yeah. to an excellent conclusion in the jedi the witch and the warlord with quiet emotional scenes paired with complex fights from director rick famiua uh, the season finale manages to complete satisfying arcs for all of its characters while still setting up a big cliffhanger ending. Fucking yeah, hell. Fuck Nine out of ten. Nine. Nine. Almost perfect. Almost yeah, perfect. <laughs> they pretty much nailed it. There's not much more they need to do. 90% of 100%. <sighs> what did they give the episodes throughout the season out of curiosity? Presumably lower than that, because they always go fucking ham on finales, right? Uh, well, hold on, I'll look it up, just give me a second. No uh, problem. What did they give Ahsoka throughout the The full season? season review by Samantha Nelson. <laughs> 8 out of 10. Great. Okay, so that's a full season review, so... Is that uh, the person who made this video? Uh, I don't know. Oh, well, I doubt the person who reviewed that is the person who reviewed, just did the, the video we saw, but IGN probably need to have a talk with the, each other about how this works. Because, uh, I don't know if they know, but IGN scores are seen as IGN scores. They're not seen as IGN person 1, person 2, and person 3. Oh, exactly. Nobody thinks about it that way. Uh, well, they gave episode 5 and 9. Um, oh, fucking course. Well, to be fair, she may have given that one a 9, too. She even admitted, like, it got to her. Yeah, uh, right. Hmm. I'm just trying to find a nice, helpful list that just has them. Uh. Episodes 1 and 2 got a 7 out of 10. Hmm. Hmm. I just want to... Get them... Give them, give them to me in order. Yeah, so episodes 1 and 2 got a 7 out of 10. Uh... I don't know why it's so hard. I'm just trying to find them like in a sequential order, but they're not listed that way. Hold on. Were you like uh, finding tweets and stuff? No, I'm just trying to find them. Okay, here we go. Here's here's more of a list. So episode. Let's. Uh, I'll just pull them up in order. 
Okay, so episodes one and two were a uh, seven. Episode three got an eight. Jeez. Remember, episode three was half of it was them flying around in their fight with remember, <laughs> I remember when they were going yeah. the That was an eight. Okay, episode four, which was them in the forest, got given a six. I don't even know and the this logic is the, behind this. This is the description: Ahsoka episode four, Fallen Jedi, features excellent lightsaber fights and big <laughs> plot was brought down by flat cliche dialogue. That's the show. That's the whole show, yeah. The yeah, whole show. Talking. And then, of course, episode five was a nine out of ten. Uh, episode six got given a, not a nine out of ten. Um, wow. Okay. okay. Episode seven got a seven out of ten. Which, uh, yeah, I guess that explains that what the the season as a whole got an eight out of ten. That seems like it basically averages out. But there were a few nines in there. There was there was at least three nines, right? Yeah, three nines out of ten. Mm -hmm. I'm like, damn, man, there's not much you could have done to make it better. And meanwhile, they've got this video out talking about how basically the whole season is worthless. <laughs> yeah. It is funny because, again, it's different people, but people don't think about it that way when it comes to IGN. Well, and it's like, damn, man, maybe man. IGN staff should have a little chat, see what they think about this show compared to because... Yeah, like to 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 simultaneously from a similar company source say that there's fantastic character arcs all being finished perfectly versus there's nothing for the characters at all. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Would you say that any episodes of uh, Follow the House of Usher were at least a nine out of ten? I I'm just really careful about nine. I want to rewatch yeah, it. Like very, it's uh, it's high. That's the thing. It's nine's nine, a high nine, ass nine, number. Nine's a very uh, exclusive little club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then 10 is like the VIP of the VIP of the VIP, you know, it's hard to get into yeah. that room. Um, but yeah, I don't know, that's just funny, and it's sort of reflection of the state of media criticism, I guess, because uh, she was even going back there all the way to Mando Season 2 being like, we're covering a lot, it's that was in a sorry state, but a state that is recognizable, because Marvel's going through the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And so our uh, uh, coverage of Loki, which is coming uh, in the form of EFAP yeah. TV, but for now I guess we can tell you that we didn't think episodes 1 and 2 were very good, guys. Sorry. No. Uh, yeah. Episode 2 was pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, episode 1 was pretty bad, too. It's just that we... It was pretty bad. We, coming off Ahsoka, we, we, were, we were dazzled a little bit by the artistry of, you know, things outside of writing, basically. Where, did, where does Loki even go at after this point, didn't they like unlock anywhere the multiverse? You know, it'll go anywhere, do anything. It's all just like whatever happens, man. It's it'll all be, just so there's no structure to the world anymore. It's just sometimes whatever. you can just invent a character called Brad who has all the information you need, and then they spend a whole episode <laughs> chasing him and torturing him until they get the information they need at the end. That's that, that's something you could do. Next uh, time. Oh. Also, hey. Sylvie's in McDonald's, and that's that's uh, that's something. It's going great. Two like episodes. Multiverse McDonald's. Yeah. Uh, not even clear on exactly how she got there or why she sort of ended up there. She's ended up at McDonald's, and uh, Mobius like awkwardly says, "Like I thought you were coming here to ambush us or something, but it turns out all we got was a really great meal." Just like yeah. Oh. Okay. Are you memeing? Or no, that's that actually. Th that's essentially the line, and and it was just like, <laughs> like okay, that's, it's pretty. Yeah, um... the line is, "Boy, McDonald's sure is good. You should eat McDonald's." And then he thumbs up to the screen. That's cool. And he blinks. I yeah. love. And then I he love... goes, "Ka chow." Uh, throughout the scene, he keeps moving the uh, shake that he's drinking to make sure the 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 icon of McDonald's is facing the camera. The logo, yeah, yeah, the logo is always kind of you know, making mm -hmm. a nice camera. It's very Good important. Stuff. You have that to look forward to, as mm. well as everything in the future of all of these wonderful franchises. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that that's uh, man. We we did two videos, and we probably in record time, or at least older EFAP time, I'd imagine. But um, we're probably going to wrap up there. Uh, it was not going. You got to... two wow. videos, all right, guys? You got two videos. <laughs> we got to well, remember got many videos. I was gonna say the, the thing that they they gonna they they gonna start spamming frustrations is like go watch the. Saw 5, Saw 4, Saw 3, Saw 2, Saw 1, or the four newest episodes of Ahsoka TV, the catch-ups that are yeah. coming out, which we need to make more of as well. But the thing is, 
me and Fringy got to go back to the editing room to get all this stuff out for you guys, okay? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if you yeah. know, but uh, we've got several editors working, expending themselves to uh, limits to get these things done on time because we want to get them done on time. At the same time, we're trying to get these fucking spooky games streamed for Halloween, which is funny because I've taken up most of October with Sekiro, Liza P, and um, I don't know if this has been mentioned yet, but me and Matt were talking about it. We'd like to do it, so we're probably going to. Uh, we're going to stream Lords of Fallen together. And what I mean by together is that we're going to do something that we've never done before just to see if it, what kind of funny things could happen. Streaming the game in a call at the same time, but, you know, campaign. So that we make different decisions, see how long it takes to go through different things. Probably going to be uh, on Monday. So there's that as well, right? You're getting streams a lot, so don't don't you worry. But like I said, you got Loki EFAP TV coming, and I'm trying to sort out the next arc while this arc is coming out with the Saw stuff. And you still got plenty of episodes, okay? So go go find more. We've also got something else on the way um, that I don't want to announce just yet because I don't think it's fully ready, but it's almost there. Um, but yeah. Um, also, thank you so much, Solar Sands, uh, for coming on. Oh, yeah. Really, really great yeah. talking to you, and I appreciate all the insight on Mr. Kincaid, as well as some other bits and bobs about art. And of course, you seem to have an investment slightly in Star Wars, which worked out. <laughs> like to talk about a bit of Ahsoka. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Pretty fun to talk about art. I like the discussion we had. If you guys ever have a art-related video or something you want me to even just get some other more context for, I'm happy to come on ever happens uh, yeah, yeah absolutely it's fun um oh and that's a fair two questions why were there no sh comment showcase in ahsoka minis uh the reason was we were struggling to be able to we hate them <laughs> we were struggling to get them out on time with the editing as they were let alone having the comment showcase sections which obviously there's uh cutting down animations and uh visual references that are important to support points and stuff so that we if we put them in, I'm not sure if we're going to anymore, if we're going to be able to get these things out at a reasonable time, as opposed to, I imagine you guys would be pretty upset if we only had coverage up to episode six of Ahsoka out right now. You know, you'd be like, guys, the show's been over for like several weeks. It's like, I know, but we had lots to edit instead of them coming out relatively quickly after them. But of course, I mean, you know, the comment section is still there for you wonderful people to enjoy, to comment back and yeah. forth, check out with each other, discuss, and um, uh, at least do super chats. Well, it, it, this we're not. Um, we could obviously watch more videos if we were going to continue the stream, but uh, the or do super chats, whatever have you. The uh, the problem is that we've got to get back to uh, editing, basically, both me and Fringy. I've got uh, there's stuff I want to do that I can't do because there's stuff I have to do that I can't do because there's other stuff I have to do. I'm being vague on purpose in case any of these projects fall through for whatever reason. Trying to do my best to catch up. Well, also, I gotta fucking finish Sekiro, too. I'm gonna try and do that tomorrow. So, you can see that as well. I got, I think, I heard someone say three bosses. I believe that's what I've got left. And then, of course, yes, we, me, Rags, and Fringy look for opportunities to record all of the uh, Super Chats. We'll probably label them so they match the episodes, too. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. I don't think there's a, a rags for me if I missed. Uh, is there anything no, else? No, I don't not, think so. Not Excellent. Okay, yeah. so yes. Good recap. Those are all the updates for stuff to come. Obviously, Halloween's the busiest time of year for EFAPers yes. in general. Many you got, speaks. according to, where have I got the image of the releases? I can't remember how um, that X was drawn anymore. I think you're getting a saw on the 18th, the 20th, the 24th the 29th and the 30th. I think that's the rest of them. And then peppered in between will be Loki, Super Chat Catch-Ups, and regular episodes, of which we've got a shit ton to do. Uh, uh, good God, the amount of guests and videos i got to get sorted and scheduling. Um, but it'll be a fun month, so thank you all for joining us. Appreciate it. The kind messages and donations, what have you. We shall see you in the future, whenever that may be. But for now, sleep well, or, you know, be awake well. Either one. It's totally fine. Bye-bye. Yeah, goodbye, yeah, everybody. everybody. Thanks bye, for bye, being here. Yeah, we'll see you later.